Uh, the the tweet I sent last night. Uh, about... Yes. Yeah, about the New York Times endorsement. <laughs> that was the best take ever. <laughs> we all die. <laughs> I think this is going to be the music in Bryce's cult's waiting room. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, this is an eight-minute song that I've never heard of before. What the hell? Bryceology will <laughs> teach you how to release your inner rage. Are you being oppressed by what we call... The Justin Drewwood. <laughs> we will help you fight back. This is the um, Infected Mushroom and Bliss. Their new role. Uh, Ani Mevushal. Yeah, that's exactly what I would have guessed. Obviously. First guess, yeah. Ani Mevushal. It's weird. It's got this Ayahuasca like. Ayahuasca was oh, no, all somewhere. Process. It's got this like metal like aesthetic, but I know it's gonna turn into dubstep. <laughs> Hello, everybody. We're gonna start with three things here in just a few minutes. all right yeah anything of note happen um i got my car inspected did you yeah uh anything of note i got our passes i walked through san francisco because uh of the women's march uh getting a uber was a little bit more complicated because of oh here you go here uh, you go, uh, just criticizing. I took it My as Uber's a, I, over there. I took it as a sign. <laughs> you want to know what? I'll just hoof it. I did a nice little 40-minute walk <laughs> mm -hmm. into, into Japantown from the Embarcadero. Nice. And a nice walk back. Mm -hmm. It was it was pleasant. I saw the... Uh, <laughs> I'll actually text it to you. I'll text it to all of you. <laughs> I'm going... um, I was startled. Startled by a mural as I, I absentmindedly uh, was just looking to my left and I noticed the uh, the wary eyes of uh, of somebody. I just texted it to all of you. <laughs> but just uh, uh, the eyes of a mural bearing down upon me. Oh, my gosh. Is that Greta? Oh, the Greta. I was wondering if it was going to be the Greta mural. It was the Greta mural. <laughs> yep. Oh, wow. Yep. Uh, totally not a cult, guys. Totally not yeah. a cult. It was uh, how dare I uh, uh, walk <laughs> the way I walked. But uh, uh, that was startling. And uh, <laughs> You're like, I'm going to walk today because uh, what else do I need to be doing? <laughs> it's these yeah. shoes. They're made of non-recyclable materials. Ah! I eat I, I eat my shoes because I think that's the best way to dispose of them. How much how much parental coaching do we think Greta has? Uh, <laughs> uh, by the Facebook outage the other day um, that apparently revealed uh, who was actually running the page and doing a lot of the media stuff. Um, She's a very well-spoken, very passionate young woman. 
coincidentally, there is a very big, powerful uh, environmental movement, whatnot, that's been helping specifically, you know, Sweden, whatnot, that seems to be of uh, working hand in hand with other organizations to say, hey, let's make this happen. Uh her mom sang in the Eurovision Song Contest. Who hasn't? Yeah. <laughs> we watched it. We watched it on the stream. Oh, yeah. yeah it was all right. Yeah. A little pitchy. Ha! <laughs> 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 uh, but, yeah, that's that's about as, uh, I don't know, whenever these things come up, it's just like, I, I'm always on the side of, uh, you know, kids speaking their mind. I think it's a good it's a good thing to encourage um uh, you know past that you know she spoke her mind <laughs> you know that's yeah. good for that you know how everybody else takes that is up to their own uh i'm their glad own lisa prices. simpson finally got a platform <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, but it was a big mural. <laughs> it was yeah. a really big mural. I'll tell you that. It was, and, and that that thing had to go up quick because that thing only happened a couple months ago, right? What what thing? The the Greta Thunberg uh, her, showing yeah, up on her, the her big scene, like climate, yeah, her climate, her speech or whatever. But uh, they work fast there in San Francisco, where, by the way, we'll be doing our live comedy show. Yes. At the SF Comedy Fest. Sketch Fest. At the King of Fight Theater. Sketch Fest. Oh, my God. I call it uh, I don't like all that. right. It's Monday, friend. What's going on? How many packs of the, the, the money you got, Brian? What's that? You got a lot, a lot of packs there? Yeah. Got a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Um, Just occurred to me that uh, we got we got that drug dealer attache case, and uh, it seems like, uh, it seems like we sh that should be full of a bunch of fake money. So okay. here we are. Well, it could be full of money or, you know, Ziploc bags full of something else. Sure. Actually, wow. that Slush probably would be You know what's probably funny? Probably would have been is, cheaper is, is, and, and Yeah, that probably would be guy. cheaper, <laughs> but uh, only barely. Like, apparently fake money is very, very cheap nowadays. It's crazy. You got a whole box of money there. How much did that set you back? Uh... Let's see, um, twenty thousand dollars of fake money was, I guess, uh, a little over uh, like a hundred and fifty dollars. I I I can't quantify two hundred twenty thousand dollars. Like, how many is that? Would that be enough to fill that briefcase with I, that box of money? You know money? what? Because I don't know that. I don't know that it is. It I'm gonna have like to. I'm gonna have to put got more fake. Yeah. Should have got what, 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 But that's the thing is like twenties are no cheaper than hundreds. Mm -hmm. It's like you're better off just getting hundreds. Wow. So. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. All right. You guys want to do weird there's, things instead? YouTube people problems. It's a, it's a real thing. There's got to be like a warehouse filled with some like African currency or Confederate banknotes or something somewhere that you could just like. <laughs> this is actually the reason that uh, for the beginning of the 20th century, all money was Mexican dollars. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever seen like in old movies, they've got, you know, they, they have what you mean movie like money was. cartoon. No, no, no. Yeah. Like, like any movie that appeared on film. That's what I said. Yeah. Movie yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. was uh, Mexican currency. I did not know that. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. You guys want to do weird things? Cool. Yeah. Yep. All right. Andrew, take it away in three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. And Bryce Castillo. Uh, actually, actually, can we... Uh, sorry, you, your your internet like just started to like kind of wonk out on that. Do, do you... Do you I... Do you, uh, I, yeah, are you I able mean, to like restart your router or something really quick before we get deep into it? Um, whatever. I'll, 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 hang, I'll hang up and do that. Sorry. It's um, okay. No, I, it's just. No yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering whether or not that was just. Uh, yeah. Just me. I mean the vi the video is one the video we we've, we've always kind of had, you know, kind yeah. of stuff with, but uh, when it's the, when it's the audio, then that that gets to be. 
Uh, well, hey, we can just keep talking. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bryce, did you did you watch any of the uh, any of the HBO last night? New HBO debuting. Uh, uh, you talking about uh, Avenue Five? I did not. Avenue Five and and Curb Your Enthusiasm. Oh, you know, I have never seen Curb. I've seen clips and stuff, but I've never seen an episode of Curb. Pretty, 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 pretty good. Yeah, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Uh, I didn't watch the most recent episode. In fact, I probably dropped out like at season four. But <laughs> like, I, I went. The problem was is that I I binged Curb Your Enthusiasm, which I would not recommend. Like really? get like two episodes and then don't watch it for another week and then watch like two episodes. Cause when you binge it, boy, I think because they are a it li- largely improvised show, mm-hmm. uh, the basic structure remains very similar episode yeah. by episode. It's like scene one, Larry learns about a thing for which he will make an embarrassing decision later on. Then there's a couple other scenes that set it up, maybe a little freelance kind of thing. Then he makes a horrifyingly and irredeemable embarrassing decision. Uh, Then Larry hides the embarrassing decision that he just made. And then the embarrassing decision comes to fruition uh, at the most inappropriate moment. And Larry is very embarrassed and lashes out at everybody around him. And that's mm-hmm. hilarious. It's a tried and true formula. You're never upset to see him be put in these situations because it is always consistently funny. But when you binge it, oh man, does it does it start to uh, does it start to look uh, uh, not so? Uh, uh, it, it starts to just you start to see the seams a little bit. Yeah. Um, I can switch to go to my LTE on my phone. That's uh, what it looks like I'm still. Yeah, because your audio is still not coming in. Yeah. yeah. Right. I have zero control over that, so. Yeah, no. <laughs> that sucks. Um, right, you, guys watching, uh, you guys watching the new Pope? They the, there's a Monday show. That's oh, definitely yeah, no, on my HBO to-dos. Mondays. So, so this is a straight-up uh, follow-up to the young Pope? Yes. Is it good? The one episode that they put out is pretty good. It's actually really weird because in Europe, because I think they show it on Canal Plus or Sky something, uh, they are doing two a week. So like you go to the Reddit and they have to like split up the discussion thread. So um, we've only got episode one here in America, but I think it's pretty good. Um, you know, you remember how kind of eclectic uh, the first, you know, the young Pope was. Sure. Uh, uh, the fact that it's called the new Pope, uh, does that imply that, that somebody comes in, like he abdicates the job or something? Uh, well, I mean, you remember how the, the new Pope ended? The young Pope. Or the young Pope ended, right? Uh, I, I, I pretend I didn't. Okay. Well, so he's, uh, he's giving his first really public speech where he's showing his image. Uh, and he's looking out into the crowd of Venice, and he thinks he sees his parents, and he's giving this whole speech. Andrew, do you think you can give us a, a landscape mode, if if you're able to? We also cannot hear you. Um, yeah, t- take your time. Take your time. We'll figure this out. Um, uh, and so he like collapses, and oh, that's right. And you kind of don't know his fate. Got it. So so while he's out of it, they have to have some pope. So somebody else comes in and he wakes up and right. coma shenanigans ensue. Yeah, more or less. I, I was saying uh, last week. Oh, because because you weren't uh, you didn't join us. Yeah, particulars last I went week. there. Um, also, we got in trouble. Apparently, you guys called Jewel State old. Who? <laughs> the uh, Kaylee from uh, Firefly. They're like, all old now. Come on. Uh, somebody, somebody demanded a public apology. <laughs> I will. I will. Which re- is amazing. <laughs> I declined. I declined to do that at this time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't understand the question, and I won't respond to it. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I was saying this about the first episode. So the whole, I mean, that's the whole thing of the trailers and the promotion is like, oh yeah, then there's a new pope, and it's John Malkovich. But Jude Law uh, wakes up from his coma, and so there are two popes. What's the deal? Um, and the first episode is very funny because neither Jude Law nor John Malkovich are in it very much. In fact, I don't think John Malkovich is in the first episode at all. What about that dude that loves the uh, uh, the fat lady statue? Oh, I mean, that first episode is almost all about him. Viello? Yeah, he's yeah. great. 
he has a you get to see like inside the paper the, the people the dude voting. who loves the fat lady statue i would love to believe that that's what it says in the script for his character <laughs> name um uh, but you get to see like the election process and some of the like politicking uh, and some of his influence spread. There's white smoke. There's black smoke. There's there's gray smoke. Gray smoke. It's insane. That's right. <laughs> All the smokes you could want. Um, but yeah, I think it's pretty good. And I, I'd like to see the the Hugh Laurie Avenue Five uh, HBO show as well. A lot of shows. Tom and I were also talking in after talk. There are just a lot of shows. There's Avenue Five and The Pope and um, uh, Picard, I think, started. Hey, uh, Better Call Saul. I heard is Picard just is uh, bad. From who? I haven't heard that. Uh, from people. People in the know. I have heard from a person. I've heard rumblings from a person who might also be in the know who thought it was good. Yeah? Yeah. Is that person you? You could tell me. It, it was me. I got <laughs> I'm breaking my NDA. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they just renewed it for a second season, so they must be confident in whatever it is. I mean, yeah, I'm confident that networks like money. Do they? No, they do. Uh, Web Magic is Picard is Thursday. That's right. Um, uh, Better Call Saul is in mid-February. Uh, let's see. We, we got Andrew Main on the line. We do see him. Can you say something for us, Andrew? Or maybe he has. I'm gonna just cry for a moment here. But it's okay <laughs> to everybody. Oh, there I we go. We don't. gotcha. I, I just I don't want to do the Skype rant again. <laughs> or the Wi-Fi and everything else. Hi guys. Hi. Yo. You sound pretty good on your uh, uh, those AirPod Pros. Oh, why yes, they are. Oh, very nice. All right. Well. Um, oh. No, no, no. If you can. Oh. If you dear. can be wide. I. Can, I I, yes, guys, I know, but I need to make an adjustment here, okay? Oh, sure, I understand sure, sure, how uh, widescreen works. <laughs> uh-oh. Hopefully he quit the app so that he paused and not have to do that. Oh, and he dropped the call. Okay. Um, what else? Oh, Lock and Key comes is on air very soon. Oh, I'm so upset. I tried to watch the trailer. I couldn't make it through the trailer. I started to get upset and then stopped really? watching the trailer Just because like the, the trailer looked. made it look like it wasn't as good as it deserves to be. And then I stopped watching. But see, remember what I say, Netflix, Netflix, notoriously bad at trailers. trailers. You, you, don't make you're hundred percent correct. You're hundred percent correct. Hey, oh. So I switched over to, uh, the, uh, cell phone. I mean, I switched off wireless now, and I look pretty janky here. But at least it looks like it's flowing. Yeah, it looks. Um, it actually looks yeah. pretty good to us here. Um, not seeing okay. any video hitches. Audio seems pretty smooth. So, um, okay. I think we're good to start. If you're feeling good, unless you need a minute to. Uh... No, I'm good. Thank you for your patience. I apologize. No, I didn't. Absolutely. I. Hey, that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. All right. Well, <laughs> then, Andrew, I'm gonna count you in again. In three, two, one. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hey! Brian Brushwood. Yo-ho! And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. Uh, first off, we're recording on, it is Martin Luther King Day, and so I think we should at least mention that. Uh, you know, the celebration of the life of somebody who did a lot to unite us, and I think that it's worth remembering that. So, um would 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 not want to proceed without at least calling attention to that. So, um. yeah, you know, uh, uh, I've been uh, reading a lot about uh, for the Raise the Dead podcast, uh, 1960, 1964, and and by proxy, 1968, and that really is the kind of rise uh, and uh, a, a peak uh, of his powers of Martin Luther King, and, and specifically in 1964, running up to the Civil Rights Act. Uh, there's a, a lot of I would encourage people to read about Martin Luther King as he was written about as that was going on, as that summer in summers in 1963, 1964 uh, are are boiling over. And uh, uh, really did the, the, the difference of how much of a difference he made in terms of making nonviolent protests something that uh, was not only the most uh, uh, effective, but also something that he positioned as 
a uh, uh, it is honoring the law to break it with full knowledge of the consequences and then immediately suffer them so you can bring attention to an unjust law. And uh, I think that that is, especially for that time, when you understand what, you know, uh, uh, how, how differently things could have gone, uh, that, was, that was something truly revolutionary. And, and I would encourage folks to, to pay more attention to that. Yeah, I, th I think that's, you know, one of the most important lessons of history is the idea that in, you know, in democracies, the nonviolent protest is the way to show you kind of have the moral higher ground. You know, once you reject the use of violence, but use put yourself in line and do civil disobedience, et cetera, but reject violence, it's 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 hard to be called the bad guy. Yeah, when you're doing that. So, uh, there we go. So, uh, gentlemen, uh, hear any explody things last night or the day before or yesterday? I mean, I don't know why I would. Uh, you know, we. we, we got home we took it easy we watched a movie i i did watch the movie 1917 which uh with i which i thought was a, a fine film there was a lot of explodey things on that but uh from the nature of your tone i assume there's something else i should have heard we had a planned explosion by spacex and nasa yesterday as they blew up a falcon 9 oh wait there this is this is the thing where they were testing the thing that will save the crew if 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 things go explodey Right. So they have part of the Crew Dragon test program. They have the Dragon capsule with the Crew Dragon, which goes on top of the Falcon 9. And it's designed as, you know, needs to have an, an abort system, an escape system. That's one of the things that NASA requires for spacecraft, not needed the space shuttle, um, that they have is this some sort of escape system. And in order for Boeing and SpaceX to qualify, they've had to do different demonstration tests to show this. And SpaceX was like, yeah, we'll do, we'll do our uh, crew abort test and we'll put it on top of a falcon 9 we'll blow up the falcon 9 and we'll let this thing escape and uh it went off great they actually did it like i think like 7 a.m yesterday whatnot <laughs> and at about a hundred thousand feet up in the air this thing uh separated the falcon 9 blew up there's some really wonderful footage out there of it because there were so many people out there with their cameras and their telescopes trying to capture it and the crew dragon separated and then basically went through coasted for a while then parachutes Ejected and uh, deployed, rather. Be bad if they ejected. Holy and cow! God I've damn. never seen this footage. That is a, an extraordinary explosion. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, look, yeah. uh, I, I, we're, we're, it's not a contest, but uh, that seems to be a much bigger explosion than we saw when the Challenger disaster happened. I mean, that that's extraordinary. What? Am I wrong? He's muted. Um, so uh, it was an amazing explosion. <laughs> um, and if I have to write, yes, nobody died of this one, so it is a better explosion. Uh, and it is, uh, was a very great, you know, a good test of this thing, a good test to see, you know, how things would handle in this. The first stage as you saw, got annihilated. And then the upper stage actually like there's footage of that thing just sort of like descending and still making its way down until it probably just crashed into the ocean. So do they like strap on an actual explosive device or how, how do they, how does one initiate an explosion for this kind of simulation? Uh, I think that in this case, just this, the, the separation system itself might cause it just by like when you fire a bunch of, you know, your rockets at the other end of it. And then what happens with the rocket itself is once it loses that, that, uh, that nice narrow dynamic nose of the escape of the capsule, all of a sudden all that aerodynamic pressure just impacts the rocket. So I think that it just might be enough to just separate it. Um, this is remarkable. And the first thing that comes to my mind is like, if you really want to get that NASA money, like Brian, you just went through this with the new building where it's like, all right, you have all this adrenaline that goes into like buying a new structure. Right. And then you realize like, and of course you realize, all right, it's going to take a lot of money to get this up to snuff. Like, obviously we're going to have to put some investment in. And so you partition some money and you go forward, but it's always more than you think. 
right? And I can only imagine that at some point during the process of SpaceX being like, all right, look, cheap rockets, we can launch them, we can launch them safe, we can launch them with people, whatever you need, we got it here for you at SpaceX. And then at some point down the road, they're like, yeah, okay, so where's the one that explodes on purpose? <laughs> it's like, oh, wait, we need one that, because these are expensive, guys. I mean, like, that's a lot. I mean, I know we're doing them cheaper for you, but like, it's, yeah, 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 no, sorry, it's, it's in the contract. Uh, uh, you just need the one that uh, we explode on purpose. And also, <laughs> you're going to need another one for my son's bar mitzvah. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it's just, he's just a big fan. So if we can throw in, let's just do an even uh, f uh, five. Five explody rockets on purpose. But don't worry, uh, uh, you're eventually going to get this sweet NASA money that will be more money than you could ever count forever. And we'll fill them with glitter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the uh, best jokes I heard was because apparently uh, Elon Musk's girlfriend Grimes is pregnant, and apparently by Elon was maybe he was it was a missed opportunity to do a gender reveal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, Turns out go. the gender yeah. of the child is money, government money, <laughs> lots of it. Well, apparently at this point, SpaceX has probably spent more than they've made on the program, but looking towards long term. Uh, they'll, you know, likely come out ahead. Um, but because remember, they got half as much as Boeing got. And, you know, Boeing apparently couldn't afford a bolt to a, attach one of their parachutes from the last thing or a guidance system on the mission, the other mission. So um, it's hard. All this is hard. I don't dump on Boeing. Yeah, I think it's OK now, actually. They've done enough that we can dump on them without feeling bad. But uh, you uh, want to know what? I think they'll be fine. I think, that, <laughs> I think that's some mean words of people on a, on a podcast. Uh, I think that Boeing, uh, 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 they've, they've proven it, uh, that, that they, they, they're going to tough this one out, little little tykes. Well, you know, the, it, true, the hard part, it's more like when you're a talented person working for those companies and you are very good at what you do and you're good wherever you are at your job, and then you have management, other people make bad decisions, it's demoralizing. And then to hear people like me go, well, this company did this. And then there's somebody's like, hey, I, I did my job, jerk. What do you do? You just, you know, make up stuff and write it down. So that's why I always sort of feel bad because I think about, you know, the rank and file people who work in these companies who are extremely talented. And so it feels bad, you know, where some bad decisions affect them. That's how oh, I feel sure. when I tear apart movies on cord killers. I remind myself that <laughs> human beings worked on this thing. <laughs> yeah, but I'll tell you about here's the thing about movies, though. You shouldn't feel as bad. Um, most of the people get to move on to another one, and so they're not attached. You know, if you were, you know, the, the set designer on this movie, like, yeah, that movie stunk, but then I worked on this other movie next, which was great. Whereas if you work for a company for the next 30 years and it's got a bad rep, it's like, yeah, uh, there's that's it. There's always this moment in any television that I've been a part of or or the commercial stuff that I did with Brian where when you're on the set and everybody's like really nice to you and everything and it's uh it's super fun and then like at the end they're like your friends for a period of time and then uh you get to the end and you're like man I really hope that this thing becomes a thing and they're like yep <laughs> me too and then <laughs> you just know that there's like, there's like this, this, uh, uh, there's, there's a detachment that I'm sure that it is from their perspective, it's necessary, right? You can't get attached to everybody. You can't, you can't fall in love with every puppy you see in the pound, right? Because you can only, uh, it's out of your control, which one happens. But, uh, uh, there's always that moment where like when you're leaving, you're like, oh no, wait, you're, you're just on off to the next one. And I'll just be sitting here waiting waiting to see whether or not this happens again and I, we become best friends forever or uh, I just never speak to you again. It's like, this is my moment. Now is about me. And they're like, yeah, same as the last 20 people we worked with on shows. Exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> that Nobody is cares. Uh, there's definitely that moment. That moment where you're like, hey, man, great working with you. And you, for you, it's like, it's like, oh, dude, I just made this connection. This is great. Like, these are my new Hollywood friends. And they're like, yeah, cool. Anyway. Well, and, and the perverse part is that that feeling only arrives at the very end of the project. Once oh, you've yeah. made it through the unbeatable journey, like you're suddenly like, we did it. We did it. And now I can bother to care about you as a human being. And they're like, that's great. 
the perfect time as I emotionally divorce myself from everything we've done for the last few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Fame is a fickle thing. And I remember every, every day you get a new lesson in this. And I was, I was at a, uh, I was at a friend's house They have a nice big piece of property and they made some comment like, oh yeah, we own a little partial down there. There's, there's a trailer there. I'm like, oh, okay. And they go, such and such star from some TV show in the eighties lives in there now. And you're like, Oh geez. <laughs> you're like, Oh, you know, well, the view's great. Um, like, <laughs> you're like, wow, this is, this is depressing. Um, I'm going to go back home to Florida and <laughs> write books. <laughs> um, unless there's more, another trailer available. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, anyhow, uh, so that's good news, though, by the way. So what's next is the next up is to put actual crew onto the Dragon Capsule. Yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, we got we got the first humans that are going to uh, test this capsule, right? Yep, yep. And maybe as soon as March. They think they'll have hardware ready by March. We'll see when that happens. And if that goes well, then wonderful. And, you know, uh, hopefully we can get the Boeing Starliner. You know, that's going to proceed along. And, you know, we'll have two new options for getting people into space from American soil. And that's sort of the big, you know, Jim Bridenstine, the head of NASA says, you know, you know, American astronauts and American hardware launching from American soil, which you'd be something like, ah, it sounds a little bit jingoistic. Like it's NASA. It's, it's funded by America. You know, you kind of, you know, so was, was there any setback to, I, I remember a year or change ago that we were worried that the, uh, the testing of the escape mechanism, you know, the fact that the capsule exploded or whatever would be a big setback for getting us using, uh, us being Americans, uh, using the SpaceX to get people up to orbit. It, 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 I guess it turns out that all that was a okay. Well, so what happened was they did the, they did the test of the, 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 the first test to actually sent a crew dragon up into orbit and it came back down. And uh, actually, it was the one that docked, I think, at the state station and came back down, and um, it, which was cool. Like, I actually went for the launch of that, which is pretty amazing. And then when they went to go test it afterwards, they filled it back up with, with uh, they have these hypergolic fuels, which are the ones they use to escape really quickly. They're hypergolic because basically they don't need igniters. Once they touch, they just blow up, which they're super powerful, but they're super dangerous. So they put a hypergolic fuels on them, and they put this thing on the test stand, and they started shaking it, and it flew up. They went through and they found out that the reason it blew up was that normally in a uh, an escape system like that, you have a valve that doesn't that oh, once it opens, it permanently opens, it never closes. Because this was designed to be reusable, they had a valve that would open and shut. And when they went to put fuel in there, they had a leakage between one section and the other, and that caused it to go explodey. And so SpaceX like, well. We won't make this part reusable. We'll just put a one-way valve on there like everybody else uses. So, you know, effectively mitigating that problem. Um, so, and NASA says, yeah, we're cool with that, you know. So basically by, by changing the uh, intention, they essentially undid the problem at that point. Yeah, because it was, you know, they were they were building these things to be fully reusable. And that's the problem is that, which is great, but. You know, whenever you put humans on stuff, you want to be testing this hardware hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times to find every situation. And when you take something like this and you dump it into the ocean, you get, might get mild corrosion or issues you're not aware of. There's a lot of factors that affect that. And so this was a sort of thing like, hey, we have this reusable part. And like, yeah, not so much right now. So, uh, But it's scary. It's just one of those examples of like you on you think you have everything done. They remember SpaceX has done dozens of launches of sending capsules to the station and back. With parachute systems, where we're all you know all this, but they added you know the new systems, the escape systems, and all that, which puts these hypergolic fuels on board, which adds a layer of complexity that you know it's hard to test for that without just launching hardware. You know, I heard it best put like NASA's approach is like you do all the paper tests, all the simulations, everything you can, and then you do a couple launches. Where SpaceX attitude's been like, let's just launch a bunch of stuff, see what blows up, then figures out figure out how to fix it. Which yeah. good pros and cons to either one. Uh, so I have a question. Did any of you get to see that the the, the Segway chair? Have we seen more of that? The whole I only saw know? the chatter on Reddit that basically uh, whittled everything down to the Wall E chair. Is it, it, once yes. you say the words the Wall E <laughs> chair, everybody thinks they know what you're talking about. Yeah. 
Um, so uh, we're watching a little bit of video of this. So Segway, years ago, one of the things they'd been working on besides the scooter had been like a wheelchair that was going to like a two-wheeled wheelchair looked really cool. I don't know how many how big of a production that ever turned into, but now they, they revealed this this other sort of chair that like as Brian just distinctly described it is, is the Wally chair. And it's this two wheeled sort of chair you hop in and it drives you around. What's the advantage of this is that like, it can probably go pretty good distances. It's extremely agile, whatnot. And it's, it's silly yet. It's still, it's a very futuristic sort of idea. And when I saw this, I started thinking about, conversations you know we had like 20 years ago when the Segway came out was is there a opportunity for some form of motorized transportation that's maybe safer than a scooter and maybe slightly larger that for cities and stuff where we say hey we want to get rid of cars or we want to do this but we want to have some way to get you from point A to point B that's modular that it's not the same as public transit you know do we do we need, I mean, is that something we would be advantageous or be cool? I mean, certainly it would be cool, cool as hell, uh, cozy as yeah. hell, fun as hell. Uh, the question I would instantly ask is, is it healthy as hell? Like uh, our bodies, yeah, we were just talking about, you know, space travel. And the biggest problem we have is that we don't bang up our bodies enough while we're in zero gravity or whatever. And so likewise, I, I wonder if the, downside to a wally chair is that you know we're not we're not we're not moving our meat enough and and getting those thousands of micro fractures that that build you know stronger bones i'm not talking a substitute for walking i'm talking like a substitute for like uber you know like yeah I mean, no, look uh, uh i think that we are we are at a fascinating inflection point for these kinds of devices and there's a reason why uh who knows where the economic model is is going to land? But like, for me, I love those stupid rent scooters. I use those rented scooters like multiple times a week. Uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, and when when Brian and and Bryce are are here, I will encourage them to use them if we are around my neighborhood because it's so easy to get downtown in a in a, a way that I wasn't able to do with or it would cost more with a Uber and uh, right now the battery power and the, and the speed on those devices are enough that you feel like you are getting there faster. Right. Uh, the, uh, it's, I don't know. I, I, I think it's, I, I think that we are, we are at a point now where they are light enough and fast enough. And the battery power is, is, robust enough that you can get where you need to go and back uh that like there's there's something there's something there because uh if you just need to go it, if basically you have a compelling reason to go three miles from where you are right and that's annoying in a car it's annoying to find parking like then then one of these items is is going to fill that need. Yeah, I. And, and by the way, O'Brien, I am. I I agree that like if we just if we, we use motorized transportation everywhere, that would be detrimentally bad. But you've kind of sold me on the idea of having one of these chairs right at my desk right now, and I could just be like, all right, guys, I'm gonna go get a Slurpee. <laughs> <laughs> I I maybe want to subscribe to this future, Brian. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that, I guess, look, I understand. I mean, uh, uh, aside from the fact that everybody everybody bags on Wally, oh, Wally's where we're headed. What you mean? Where our technological advances, even as we mismanage them, wind up saving humanity? <laughs> like it seems to me like a beautiful future where we can get as fat as we want, and as long as like eventually our brilliance from from uh, 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 the past will come and save us. There is no limit to the indulgence we can have on technology. Is the moral of the story of Wally? spoilers for wally and, and yeah I, I, are likable i do uh I, I also feel like look man if we if we're at that level of uh complexity and and scientific achievement then we also have a pill that makes us all gorgeous at all times i mean yeah, yeah i'm not really worried yeah. about us becoming yeah, we're, all, we're all we're all gonna freeze our abs until we have them and, <laughs> and you know that'll be that'll be what it is uh 
I think the thing about like I think scooters can be helpful. I I I'm one of those people that's constantly frustrated though by like going to, you know, every time I go to try a crosswalk in certain parts of like North Hollywood, they're just literally blocking the path and stuff. And I just think they need to be they need to be more mindful about that. That's my annoyance with those. It's just that the the casual way in which they're just you try to walk around some of the sidewalks here and you're like oh wow somebody just left this here. Quick um, uh, quick side yeah. jag on this topic. Do you think that? Uh, or let me put it this way. I suspect that the, uh, this is a 100% probability. It's only a question of when, when do you think that self-driving cars are so prevalent that the new hot game for teenagers to play is to jump out in front of cars on a dare for each other? (laughs) Uh, what, uh, three years, five years, 10 years. What do you think? Excluding Russia. Oh, yeah. yeah. Russia, it's already happening. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure we're going to get all kinds of stupidity and stuff whenever you see a thing like that. I'm sure. Uh, one of the things, and just a side note, one of the advantages of something like this, by the way, of this, like, of this mobility thing is scooters are cool, but I'm not going to put my parents on them. You know, yeah. I'm not going to be like, hey, guys, let's go see Oakland. Hop on your scooter, mom. Um, and finding some alternative to that would be useful. But Brian, to, to what you brought up about that, you know, one of the things that uh, Elon Musk says the Tesla is going to be doing is it will the car itself will start talking to pedestrians. Oh, like shouting at them on your behalf? Well, I mean, maybe more friendly, but yeah, it'll be like, hey, hey, hey what's hey, going on? Hey, I'm driving here. Yeah. I did. Uh, one of the advantages of going on road trips is you get to, you know, when you rent a car, oftentimes it's the latest generation of whatever is happening in cars. Uh, and, and in this case, uh, the I, w- I want to say it was a Ford Expedition we were driving. Uh, uh, they really do have those set up in what feels like a trench. It's very hard to accidentally move out of your lane on there because unless you signal, I intend to change lanes, it will it will fight you, which I, I thought was really wild. And I couldn't decide if I thought that was a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah, it was in one where the seat kept vibrating randomly. And I didn't know what it was until I realized it was whenever there was a car in my blind spot, no the kidding. seat would vibrate on the side. Yeah, which um, that's kind of like... Fat. It was like when I got the Tesla. They're like, "Here you go. Here's your car." You're like, "Well, now what? You drive it away." Like, I know nothing about electric cars. I know nothing, and you know, you just sort of you get in, and it, it was easy. But you're just that kind of like, and it worked. And that's when you find these new features. Sometimes it can be like, "I don't understand these things," but they're usually, in, you know, all vehicles are pretty well thought out. But the vibrating thing was a little bit of. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, folks, you want to know what else is really well thought out? Uh, your support of us at patreon.com slash weird things. That is, of course, where you can make sure that this show continues to rock and roll into the future. I mean, we, we started doing this podcast. There wasn't no uh, a, a, a financially viable SpaceX uh, a company, let alone one that's blowing up rockets just to impress its new buddies at NASA, huh? That's why you need to head on over here. We've been there. We'll be there in the future. Patreon.com slash weird things. Get to your own RSS feed and make sure that you get this show before anybody else. Head on over there right now. Patreon.com slash weird things. So this is another technology related thing. And I want to talk about this because I don't know. Um, there was sort of this breathless piece in the New York Times, which talked about a company called Clearview AI. And Clearview AI, uh, which there are some practices there, which, you know, the way in which the company operated, which, you know, give, may give you pause or whatever. But essentially what it is, it's a service that they sell to law enforcement. And let's say, uh, let's say somebody gets into a fight, somebody captures a cell phone, you know, photo of one of the people in the fight. They don't know the name. Clearview AI lets you take the photo and then upload it to their server, and then it compares it to all these images that people have posted to social media, and it might come back and say, hey, this is a 99% match for so-and-so, you know, for Justin Robert Young, known bar brawler, you know, and then yeah. the police might go knock on your door and be like, hey, Justin, were you in a fight? Yeah, I was. Okay. You know, case closed. So that's the idea behind the tech is that it basically allows you to find, identify people from their social media stuff. And uh, the article came out, and it's you know been people talk about you know how much is this a violation of our rights, whatever, how dangerous this, how scary this is, whatever. And 
uh, you know, my personal takeaway was like, one, I assume this had been a thing years ago. This was the plot line of like Angel Killer, right? It just described basically what was already being done. You had services like 10 Eye and whatnot, which did reverse image lookup, which was a thing 10 years ago. Yeah. And the idea there would be a more sophisticated version of that doesn't surprise me. And I'm not alarmed, but how do you guys feel? I instantly think of, and, and I, I do want to have a, a discussion about where we are right now, but the moment I read this, I instantly think of what the next step is. And it's like, if we're at a place where AIs are matching uh, faces to uh, social media profiles, then I instantly want to leap ahead into pre-crime t- uh, territory. The idea that it's like, well, I mean, uh, certainly certain behaviors and the type of things that you say have a strong correlation to, uh, you know, future uh, violent activity or whatever. I, I, uh, I don't know. In, in so many ways, I feel like all we're doing is virtualizing that which we've always done, which is in a small town everybody knows your face and your name and then they see you do a thing. Then you go to a bigger town and it's harder to track that. And now we're just catching up. So weirdly we're going back in time to where no matter how big the city is, everybody knows your face and what you tend to do. Well, partly it's look, internet sleuthing is as old as the internet. Right. And whenever we whenever a thing happens, there's a mysterious person that does something specifically something that is disagreed with with a a large portion of the Internet or something truly violent or odious or something like that. What's the first thing? Find them. Get them. Like and and so you you start to see the process of people uh, each pitching in their little bit of information. And that's why we find out who these people are as soon as possible in, in in a lot of ways it's natural uh this however is obviously just a codified version of it in in uh, you know for for my money i'm with andrew like I, I i think this is just the 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 byproduct this is just you know as as soon as we had reverse lookup we were going to have this well and, you know it's a feature on bing where if you click on the an image of somebody um, it will do a record. Like if you click, there's looks like, okay. I just clicked, I typed in weird things podcast. It went into being typed in weird things podcast. And the, one of the images came up was a screen grab. My name wasn't on it. I clicked on it and I clicked, looks like, it looks like Andrew Maine, just right there. Like, Hey, guess what? <laughs> you know, like, why are we, I don't know. Like, why are we yelling at this company when like Microsoft does this and it's freely available? You so know, he- granted, yeah, he, he, here here would be the devil's advocate position is that we do have in society a line between public figures and non-public figures. And even if we are to generously expand what a public figure is to anybody who who willingly uh, uh, puts out a podcast, right, a free medium, that doesn't include somebody who, you know, uh, uh, you know, got into a fight on the street, right? Like that, that would now, we would now have the veracity to find these people in the same way that we would if they willingly put themselves out there as an entertainer. Um, I think that line is really hard to drive. And I do not think the algorithm behind being is doing, you know, saying, Hey, we think this is a public person. This is not a public person. It just looks at, it indexes wherever that image and that face has been attached. And, and also, the, the public person thing is getting harder because it's like some people are do not choose to be public and their names are made public because they're a victim of something or what have you. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I guess, you know, my I guess my point kind of larger is just like um, I'm like I typed in the name of our high school and it's, you know, just because I want to see, like, oh, were there photos that some photographer grabbed of high school students? And yes. And then it will say looks like so and so who's a player on a high school football team. You know, this yeah. is a minor, you know, and. And I, I think I have no issue with this, I guess, is what I'm saying. Like, I have no issue with this because I think, you know, this is the future we look like. So, like, you know, like I'm looking at like there's a photo, you know, somebody took of, you know, the YouTube of a couple high school football player kids. And it is it's identifying them. Yeah. So, um, 
I, 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 yeah. So like, I don't know. I just, I think like the Brian's point, like, yeah, we did a thing like this before you looked around, you said, Hey, do you know who this is? We, when we start posting stuff on social media, we putting this stuff out there. That's not available. It's there. People will know. And I, I don't know. I guess. So then let me ask you a question. Is posting anything on social media, your declaration that you are a public figure? I, 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 wait, I wait, never... wait, wait, uh, wait, while you noodle that out, I, th I think that Justin has, has stabbed right at the heart of this thing, which is that separation of public versus private figures. I, I think it's, it's gotta go. I, I, not, not that it should go, but I think it's going like, like I don't see yeah. any way to preserve that fantasy. And I believe it's always been a fantasy, but we've never had to publicly acknowledge it before. There, there's also a difference between being a public figure and just being someone in public, right? There are. There are uh, laws about like photography and stuff that that even if you're a, a citizen, just, you know, Joe Schmo, if you are in public, you know, there are things that people are allowed to do with your likeness there. People are able to the cops are allowed to track you in public. They can you can have your photograph taken at, as various laws. And, and, and but that doesn't mean that you're a public figure. Does social media, does having a public post make you a brand or does it just mean that you're someone on a sidewalk I, I i think that's one of the things that has been so agonizing recently we did an episode of the modern rogue where we were talking about how to preserve your privacy and we got a lot of folks uh, i think it's safe to say under the age of 20 who literally didn't understand our thesis they're like well if you're not doing anything wrong why would you care about your privacy i i literally don't understand the question but um on the flip side I think all of those same people would find it very, very creepy if from the moment you walked out your front door, somebody very obviously walked right behind you everywhere you went and watched over yeah. your shoulder everything you did. Or And, and then that person was, was to turn around and for money uh, get paid to report on all those things for you. But there's something about the viscerality of the in-person experience that doesn't seem to translate to the, to the internet experience. Yeah, I, I agree that with you that it's, that it, the, the difference is eroded completely. And there's court cases have been decided, you know, have been about that where they've had to decide was this person a public or not, you know, when did, when did they did this, did this make them public, et cetera. And, and yeah, it's like you know, the 20 year old perspective, it's the benefit of having a very short past. <laughs> Is, is that, you know, when you're 25 and you go into the job interview and you see on the screen the photos of you doing, you know, keg stands and stuff, you know, with the interviewer, then you're like, oh, now I get the point. Sure. Yeah. I'm not saying or that, or, or now, know, now in my mid-40s, it's the question of, like, I don't do any searches on medical questions in any way that can be tracked on my Google account. <laughs> I make sure to open an incognito browser, yeah. use DuckDuckGo or whatever, because we live in a world where, you know, your insurance provider can decide, well, that creates a pattern that I'm not comfortable with. Beep, bop, boop. Well, they're forbidden by law to do that, but... Um, and I'm and sure maybe, they respect that. I'm sure they do, actually, because one, I don't think they're sophisticated enough to do that. And also the potential litigation in that would be catastrophic. No, no, no. Because... The, 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 the issue is not now. I, I agree with Andrew yeah. that, that there are laws that I think they would have to respect unless they want to face tremendous scrutiny by the government if that were brought to light. However, down the road when they're like, oh, we'd offer you a steep discount on your rate, if only you do this, and now you have to make the decision of, all right, well, do I retroactively turn over all of the, every uh, internet search that I've made related to health so I can get a better rate for my children? Now, now you're in a situation. Yeah, well, I... And, 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 and it's not even a matter of your searches, too. It's a matter of just your behavior. Like... I, I don't know how the uh, the Google News algorithm works, but in general, I'm going to assume that it pays attention to what types of stories you tend to click on. And uh, uh, for whatever reason, as a crazy libertarian, I am genuinely fascinated by watching the uh, the rollback of prohibition of marijuana in the United States. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't blame anyone for looking at my search history for thinking that I'm a hardcore stoner uh, as a, as a result of that. Um, and, and, and so I, uh, I don't, I don't know where it ends. No, I, I, no, I hear you. Like I got a, I did the same thing, medical stuff. Cause I, I did, 
I did look at, like I mentioned before, like I have eczema and I did a search for that and I got the most intrusive advertising you can imagine for weird treatments and stuff. And I'm like, oh, this is why I got to do this private search. I got to cut. Like I, I cut my hand on a can of chili. I got myself a good old fashioned gash. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to search for this in incognito mode because I don't know. <laughs> I just, I've just become like you. I just, with you, Brian, it's like, I'm not worried about that case. I may be wrong on that, but like, there's all these other ones. That what? And, and, and ke think. keep in mind, of course, we're experiencing all this from a place of extraordinary priv privilege where we're, we're doing it to avoid customized ads. But, but meanwhile, so many people are doing, uh, they need to engage in this uh, level of privacy discretion because they're quite literally, their lives depend on it. Yeah. 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 That's certainly, certainly true and frightening to think. So, um, you know, I, you know, we're curious always to hear what everybody else thinks about this too. And uh, I, I just, anyhow, I, the point was, I read that story. I'm like, well, yeah. I'm like, I, I described in one of my books like how you build that system. Not, and again, not like, oh, I foresaw this because it's such a basic like image scraping. All this, it's very. If you get into low level, like you know, server, you know, doing Python scripts and stuff like this, tutorials will teach you like, oh, how to scrape, you know, Google or for this image or scrape, build us a web spider, how to do this. It's a very low level, simple thing to do. And that, that somebody went out there and scraped a bunch of stuff from Facebook and Twitter of images and attached names to it. It's not, it's been done a lot. And then this, but the New York Times article was like, oh, this is, and it's like, I'm like, they actually, and they illustrate several cases where cops were able to find people based on this. I'm like, sounds good to me. You know, we've had reverse image search forever, and this is a better version of that. The question is, is, you know, should data, you know, what happens? Because like there are laws, we, or there's policies being put in place because like now to me, it's harder to scrape Facebook data. But if your face was on Facebook prior to a certain point, that database is out there. Well, know? and we've talked about this before, but it's like I am waiting for the reckoning of uh, analog photos from the 1960s where all of a sudden you're able to pinpoint – um, let's say uh, 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 Hillary Clinton at these seven different rallies in the background mm -hmm. of whatever with a 97% likelihood of, 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 a, of a perfect match or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's only a matter of processing power at this point. Like it's only a matter of people making a, an issue of it. And from somebody that has spent a large portion of last year and, and continuing into this year, uh, finding archival sound and video for 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 the Raise the Dead podcast. Let me just tell you, folks, it's all there. Like I, I go through these books and I'll just mark these things of like audio, 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 audio. It's remarkable how much everything is uploaded somewhere, even if it's some random like re-air that C-SPAN did. Like I found clips from the 1960 election in on the C-SPAN website in one of the jankiest web players that I have seen this side of, of, of real player back in the late nineties, but God damn it. If they did not have a, a re air from like 94 of the 1960 convention, like there's, wow. there's no stone unturned and, and we are only turning over a, 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 a frightening amount of new stones every day. And, one of the things that's interesting too is our ability to take things that are degraded and improve the quality using algorithms is is amazing. You look at like Photoshop, or one of the apps uh, released a, a new like uh, tool for like improving the resolution of stuff. And you know, it comes from taking millions and millions of images and looking at different scales and being able to figure out, well, we, we kind of know if this human skin is blurry like this, this is really what it looks like and out of detail. They're doing the sound stuff, whatever. Oh, this is a startup which uh, we should talk about, Resemble.ai. We've talked about before about the Adobe had that Voco, which was their system for like replicating human voice. Sure. Uh, Resemble.ai is now offering a platform where you can clone your voice and you can use it to generate your own, you know, uh, content. And so they have examples. So if you go to the examples, these are all they took. These are all computer generated versions of these people speaking to these uh, celebrities. So, so here, here's uh, a computer generated Homer Simpson. Uh, give me a sec. This website is not. Right. We will have a computer generated version of Homer Simpson. Um, so basically what this works is you record a bunch of samples of voice stuff, and then what they do is this machine the goes through part. there, it learns it. 
Oh, here we go. Here's uh, Ellen DeGeneres. How about we do Ellen DeGeneres? The worst part of my job is flying around the world, being away from my family, just to record 10 minutes of audio for an ad. Wow. Oh, my God. How about uh, <laughs> Obama? This says from YouTube. I don't know if that means. I think that means where so the they... source footage came from. Okay. Oh, come on, website. That, does, that, that sounds like Bryce Castillo. <laughs> How about John Hamm? We focus on positive themes like friendship, self-sacrifice, and fighting for the greater good. Uh, and Coca-Cola like ads. I mean, like, that's remarkable. Like, like that, that, that you can just do text-to-speech and... Uh, in fact, I, actually, here, let me ask you guys. And I'm, I'm sorry to, to derail us for a second, but this is actually something that was really bothering me, and I had no idea even what to search for. But remember back in, I'm going to say the late aughts, early tens, that format of text to speech where it was always like a man and a woman. And it was like often a bear talking to like another. Yeah, like like super lo-fi. You would just write a script and it would be super yes. lo-fi uh, a, a, a beginning of a meme. And a counterpoint of a meme, answer to a meme, punchline. Like I, I remember the one, the one that I remember was as Android started getting better. It was just like the female voice was like, "I want an iPhone," and the male voice was like, "Would you like apps? Yes. Would you like uh, switching? Yes. Would you like Flash? Yes. Uh, you should get an Android. I want an iPhone. Yes. Like, it was just." It was that thing, but I have no idea what it's called, and I have no idea how to uh, how to find it. And if, it, it, if I remember correctly, it was like a it was like a four letter word, like Mimo or something. Uh, I'm, I'm sure somebody will will nail it. Powtoons. Mm, I don't know. Anyway, all right, great radio. So now, uh, now. We lost Justin. Uh, I literally just infected everybody. Uh, yeah. Our, so if it helps, I know exactly what you're talking about. Right? I'm actually, hold on, hold on, everybody, hold on, because our our internet is uh bugging out, and so we lost the connection with everybody. Uh, are you back? Can you guys hear us? Yes. Yep. Cool. Uh, um. So we could not remember the name of things. Yes. Yeah. So while we try to remember that name, uh, what I think is fascinating is that this went from a thing that we said, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. When I built my audiomatic platform for converting like books and stuff into audiobooks, one of the things that I just assumed was that I would be able to probably plug into, there was Microsoft has voice fonts, which is kind of like this, which has been around, but it's, if it's hard to use and whatnot. But I think something will come up with a simple version of this. And this, I'm actually supposed to talk to these people soon about their platform, but you know, I figured this was coming. This is inevitable because you can look at where the code was coming. There's things like uh, Tacotron as a code base for like emulating speech and these things. And there's a lot of researchers working on doing this. We've talked for, before about a company called Descript, which uses parts of this. Uh, we're looking at, is this what you're talking about, Justin? Yeah. Extra normal. Extra That's normal. what it was. Extra normal. But those were always, that was the first time. The reason why I brought this up was because that was the first time where I remember the audio the, the, the text to audio being uh, clear enough that it now reminded you of a, a comedy bit. Like in a way that I, I don't think was, was possible before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it certainly, even in a crude form, taking text and putting it to speech changes the way in which we, we experience it. And we now have... We have a tech right now. I like to swim in pudding because pudding's my favorite thing to swim in, naked, whatever. And then just a thing, Brian told me privately. Um, and then I could put Brian, use deep fake whatever to put Brian's face over my face. And I could use this if, you know, uh, ethically, they don't allow you to use somebody else's voice. But let's say we figured a way we had the unethical version of this. And, you know, I can have Brian with his pudding confession just by doing it. My, and uh, granted, right now, we'd be like, I think it looks like a deep fake. But five years from now, we wouldn't know. 
Well, and so so what happens to us sociologically where nobody believes anything? We all become cynical, not just skeptical, but cynical. Like like it doesn't matter. See, um, I, this is, this is always this is always where we diverge on the path because I do believe we will always be able to tell. I think that that is one thing that has matured as fast as the technology is that we have had some kind of level. Now, that might break through and 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 I might be uh, the 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 you know Pollyanna in this, but I I've I've always been a believer that we will have some kind of even if it's frighteningly realistic. But what we will say is, "Oh my god, that sounds exactly like him." Uh as opposed to I have no idea whether or not this is him or her compared to their real voice. I, I, I've watched some of the new computer simulation stuff of like uh, digital avatars where they compare it to a real person and to a digital person. And the new gen, I can't tell the difference now. I cannot tell you that which one's the digital and which one's real. Now, now maybe I guess my, my issue has always been, it's not necessarily that we can't tell with the naked eye. I do think that we're going to get to that point. Uh, if, if we are not in many ways already there, but there will be a tell. Somebody will know, and we will culturally educate ourselves on those tells. I, I just don't think I don't think that's the case now. I mean, you're talking like we have people fall every day from you know we had a problem early on email scams where I could just put my name and send you I could spoof an email to somebody else and that gets people. We get people being fooled all the time by voices they don't recognize. And then you have celebrity impersonators and stuff that can do pretty good voice versions of stuff. I don't – and I think that the technology, the rate at which this stuff evolves is you, you tell me what the tell is and the AI will evolve past that. I, I, I think that's – we will get these papers like, oh, this algorithm, you know, they, we found a way to fool these AI image recognition systems. Like, yeah, that was an image recognition system five years ago. Now that you told us there's a spoof, I put that into the data set, it don't work anymore. Yeah, it feels to me like an antibody versus contagion uh, perpetual face-off. That, that will always be yeah. the case. Uh, recently, I was, I was out when we were on vacation – and I was really surprised. I got a phone call from my area code in Austin, Texas. I hit answer, and the first sound was the spectrum uh, uh, boo, 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 that, that they always play whenever there's a phone call. Then a robotic voice started saying, uh, hello, AT&T customer. So this is me, who is a customer of AT&T, who does have an account with Spectrum. And immediately, the robot voice is giving me two clues that indicate that that this is a relevant phone call. But then it veered into that stereotypical uh, spam talk, where it's just like, there's a problem with your account. Call now and pay this big bill immediately, or real trouble awaits you. Um, so... Like that was an escalation in the, uh, I don't know, complexity of the attack. Uh, but I feel like whether it's our human responses continues to escalate and get better or whether or not AI bots do better and better at filtering that stuff out, it's just going to be a perpetual battle. Yeah, I think I, I've said this before, but I think we're going to need more secure systems of communication. You know, you're, you know, an app. That's going to be, I think, a big will be a a market in the future. It's going to be the the app that you know is harder to spoof. You know, I get a FaceTime call from Justin. I know Justin initiated the call. Um, you know, and you have things like in the the iPhone, they have the the camera in the back which scans the points on the face and stuff. There's a lot of little things you could do to say one is to make sure it's harder to, to, one, you know who's calling you is who's calling you. That's a problem right now with our phone system is it's very, I used to, you did magic tricks like that where you just spoof phone numbers. I could find out who the name of your friend and I could use uh, a spoofing tool to call you from their phone number. Right. You know, and that's big problem. And, and again, not to blame the phone company. It's not like when these things were first conceived that they were thinking of the, you know, the, the acceleration of technology. So I think that's going to be step number one. It's just more secure forms of communication. So I know I get the call on the app that I know who it's from. Other than that, anything in the media, I won't believe anything. Anything, you know, um, which is where I am right now. <laughs> so, uh, Gentlemen, one of your picks? Sure. 
So uh, I've been watching this show on Netflix. Well, first we finished the the most recent Netflix season of uh, uh, Shit's Creek. It's great. I encourage it. Uh, then we started watching the second season of the Netflix series Sex Education. This is uh, uh, I don't know. I'm sure. I don't know if it's Netflix exclusive out in Britain or if it's co-financed, but it takes place in England. It stars Asia Butterfield and Gillian Anderson, and uh, it's about a sex, a famous uh, uh, a sex therapist who wrote like one of those joy of sex kind of books in the 80s and uh, 90s with her ex-husband and their child who now is in high school going through all the awkward high school things. Uh, but uh, uh, he is now this, uh, you know, a, a sex therapist to his peers. And uh, it's it's an interesting show. It's very, very well shot, and uh, uh, it has uh, likable characters, but uh, uh, I think it, it, it best exists as kind of a PSA. I often find myself watching the show saying, I hope this is popular with the youth, because it really is a better way to explain things than uh, I think uh, uh, often happens in, in just actual teenage life. Uh, and also it takes place in high school and everybody's banging constantly. So everybody has to look 27 years old, which is another weird part about it. But uh, I, I think we we're, we're all, you're, you're happier in the end considering how much nudity and sex is in the show that nobody actually looks like they're in high school. Right on. Uh, uh, this is that awkward chicken game that me and Andrew <laughs> just played of who wants to talk first about teenage sex. Uh, yeah, I no, that's the uh, man. That was uh, the eighties. The eighties, uh, you know, raunchy sort of comedy movies certainly skewed a lot of my understanding about how the world works. Yeah, you know? yeah, it was really wild. Like I was talking to the girls about how um, in a pre-internet era, um, yeah you had very few conduits to reach a lot of people. So as a result, if what you wanted to see was naked lady boobies, then uh, it made sense to just throw some into your comedy, uh, your, your, your college comedy movie, because, okay, maybe you're here for the naked lady boobies or maybe you're here for the comedy, but regardless, you're here. Uh, and also, we don't know of too many other ways for you to get your naked lady boobies or whatever. Um, I don't know. I would love to have been there when that conversation took place. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure that that none of it happened at the surface, right? But but almost certainly that I was mean, you with your kids, you with your kids, bro. Oh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. No, there's got... um, uh, 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 Kevin Smith talks about when he went from after Clerks, and then he uh, they were talking about mall rats and. Uh, the the pitch that he got from the studio was like, like oh you're the future you're 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 the new meatballs you're the new uh, uh, teen uh, uh, sex thing so you gotta have boobs you gotta have boobs and he was at that time dating Joey Lauren Adams and that's why there's that very weird scene in Mallrats where Joey Lauren Adams is changing and you see her boobs and then uh, uh, Kevin Smith's head comes through the wall was literally just because they wanted the random boob shot of the up and coming young starlet in, in the show and or in the movie. And, and Kevin Smith was really uncomfortable with it. J Joey Lauren Adams was really uncomfortable with it. They were in the heightened uncomfortable level of uh, also dating on top of being a uh, director, writer, and star. So uh, that was a uh, 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 super crazy. And that's why, you know, like the, this show is, is so weird because there's certainly a lot of gratuitous uh, uh, nudity. There's a, you know, almost every episode opens with people having sex, and and yet the the lessons are are often these like straight out of the textbook. Like ah, well this is what this is doing, and this is you know the the gender spectrum or the you know uh, what, what what urges are natural, what urges aren't. Every episode seems to tick off the box of some element of actual sex education. So it is, it is, it is a weird show. Um, man, uh, Ivan Reitman directed me He turned out. Okay. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Ghostbusters, you know, Slimer, 
had no pants on. So on the flip side from sex to violence, uh, I'll give a recommendation to the movie 1917, uh, World mm. War One movie. Um, I, I didn't know this going into it. All I knew is that it was generally positively reviewed, 89% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, about 10 minutes into the movie, I realized... Oh, shoot. <laughs> this is one of those movies where they're doing a magic trick, and the magic trick is the complete one-shot experience through the entire movie. Uh, you can kind of tell the moments that they're fuzzing some edges, but uh, I liked it quite a bit. And, uh, um, I, I mean, it's war, so it's not exactly pretty, but, uh, but I took my 12-year-old daughter, and uh, we both enjoyed it quite a bit. Cool. I'm looking forward to it. And I think this is one of those places where the single take was really justified. You know, I've seen that that the 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 faux take, the faux single take, done a few times where you're like, one, it's not really a single take. Two, it doesn't do anything for the story. Like you just you just like this was just so the director could go, look what we did, the single take. And it's like, no, you didn't. There are three cuts here. You did cut here, here, and here. But anyhow, here because it's the point of view of these soldiers, correct, going through the sequence of time. Like. I heard, I'm like, oh, this sounds like the perfect use for this, you know, for this kind of level of immersion. And and so. it is because it forces you to experience those boring moments. Like yeah. in real life to get from point A to point B, they had to fill the time with just chatting without nonsense or whatever. And it was kind of dull until all of a sudden it got really exciting in a terrifying way. And then it went back to being dull again. And you experience that as the movie goes. Uh, I, I liked it and quite they, a bit. And they punched a baby Yoda. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Bryce? Uh, yeah, I got I got a pick here. So last week, I think they had, uh, they, they just wrapped up uh, the Awesome Games Done Quick, the speedrunning live stream marathon that they do a couple of times a year now. And uh, over the weekend, I actually spent a, a bit of time like watching the archives because they put the archives of everything up on uh, YouTube. So they make it really easy to watch all of these, uh, all of these runs. Uh, and it's it's there's always good stuff. Uh, they got uh, uh, San Andreas. They they did Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, which was a cool sort of four hour run. Uh, they have a task uh, task block, the uh, tool assisted speed run, which we're we're looking at the, on the video version now, uh, which is always a fun time. Uh, where they've made a computer, they've they've programmed a computer frame by frame to uh, to play these uh, incredibly impossible uh, video games. Uh, it's, it's always a good time. Do you, do any of you guys actually watch, uh, the games on quick stuff? I mainly know about it from your enthusiasm for it. Um, I, I occasionally, for example, I remember watching like a, an original unpatched, uh, uh fallout quick, uh, speed run mm. that, that I rather liked, but, but in general, um, uh, unless I'm already familiar with the game, it's, it's hard to get me excited about watching a fast version of a game I'm unfamiliar with. Sure. Uh, they have they have tons of games. I mean, uh, when they do these two big ones every year, it's seven days straight of um, of games. Uh, I I I think it, it's it's worth checking out. They they have it. It's very easy to search on on their YouTube stuff. So if you're if you're interested, I'd say take a look. You're, they probably got something of your of your favorite game. They uh, one of the cool ones this year was uh, the Fallout anthology. So they had one runner who went through Fallout one, two, three. Holy cow! Back to back to four. Fallout One when it was a, a, a third person perspective. CRPG, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's it's interesting because those once they go to 3D, then it's like a totally different game, and you have to use different warps. Um, but it and it all you also get to see how a lot of the same thing, the same exploits you would use in one type of game, transfer into the sequel uh, because it's a similar engine. Uh, the other one is um, they do runs of Riven, the sequel to Mist. Uh, Real Mist and Mist Three. Um, so if you like Mist, it's 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 yeah yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, let me let me pull it up because it's it's fun seeing it because um, they just click through so so fast on everything, uh, and it only stops when they you know have um, uh, like animations in the actual game. Uh, so like the cutscenes, you're right, Mike. My, my two favorite things about factoids about Mist are um, one, the original version of Mist they made on HyperCard, yeah, which was you know the Apple tool, wow. which was for you know for for making very easy way to like do presentations and stuff, which you know Apple you know 
cast aside, which maybe for good reasons, whatever, but it was an amazing tool that you could let you kind of program and stuff. They did a hypercard. And then Disney, we talked about, this. you know, Disney bought the rights to Mist to make an actual amusement park based on it. Oh, oh wow. Really? Wow. They had the they have an island in one of their lakes, and the thought was as Universal or SeaWorld or whatever was opening our SeaWorld was opening up this experience where you could dive with dolphins, which was a much more expensive ticketed experience. Disney was like, Well, if that if people show up to go pay that, if they're getting a thousand dollars a day, a couple thousand dollars a day for people to go do this, maybe we could do a really cool immersive experience. So they bought the rights to Mist with the plans that like Disney does. Disney's developed so much stuff that just sits on the shelf. Like we talked about like uh, before Brian. There were actually plans to put a Disney park on top of an aircraft carrier. Wow. Um, and so the idea that there could have been a mist theme park, you know, would have been cool. Yeah. That's insane. So uh, uh, games done quick. Uh, they have all of their old archives and all the old games. It's very cool. Uh, easy to spend 20 hours or 20 minutes on it. That's, that's my pick. Andrew? So my pick is uh, you ever like you start thinking about a movie and you go like, you know, I remember when I saw that movie, it was better than I expected. And, you know, years later, you're like, yeah, I'm going to go back and watch that again and see how it measures up. And I did that with Dante's Peak. You know, there was the, the summer of 1997 was when we had Volcano with Tommy Lee Jones and Dante's Peak with Pierce Brosnan, both movies involving volcanoes destroy, you know, destroying, you know, cities in the, you know, the West Coast. And volcano was like i think like kind of like the 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 bigger bigger sort of budget one i believe but dante's peak wasn't cheap either and i remember enjoying dante's peak more and partly because i i you know i could have, have issues with the story and certain things but from a cinematic point of view a focused story the, t the point is the small town near kind of like a mount saint helens-esque type volcano is about to explode and it's a very interesting period in time because 1997, we were seeing a lot more computer effects in movies and Dante's Peak had some CGI, but they still did a ton of models. And you watch a lot of the effects and they look really good because they would use like quarter scale cars and stuff. They built what they think, the quote, like they built what was the largest miniature built, which was like a massive set of like a valley. They built, like, you see the, like, I watched behind the scenes, you see the volcano they built, the actual volcano they did to blow up themselves. This thing's, like, 50 feet wide, 40 feet tall, like, this huge, huge structure. And when they wanted to do things like cars falling off bridges, they had these quarter-scale cars set up on these bridges and stuff, and were doing things like, you know, driving them off and exploding them and stuff. Yeah, we're looking at, that was a, an image we just saw. If you go back and you look at that, the image of the, uh, the volcano there, like, if you look closely, you get a sense of scale, like a person can walk under that. Wow. You know, and uh, we just we don't do things like that scale anymore here, as far as I know. And, uh, you know, they would uh, they built like a big, huge water. They went out to like Van Nuys Airport and they, they bought every they got every scaffold they could in L.A. and further out to build a big platform to put a big water tank on top of so they could do this stuff. A lot of really amazing special effects. Some of them you know maybe look a little toho studios but most of them are pretty good <laughs> um and the story seems to me i enjoyed it so dante's peak is my my flashback go back and check it out that was Man, roger that donaldson run, directed that 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 run of, of of disaster late 90s disaster movies that you know because then right after that the next year you get the big uh uh deep impact armageddon uh uh battle but man we 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 were really into the big horrifying thing that was going to happen <laughs> yeah actually dante's peak had a higher budget than volcano did not know that um but uh that was just yeah weird interesting time you know that was a so i have a, an anecdote about uh why i knew somebody who worked on the jurassic park films and they pointed out why jurassic park 2 had the remember had the big boat that crashed into the dock Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I think I've heard this story because they were yeah, up probably. against Godzilla and, and somebody was yeah. like, we're going to have the best of all worlds, just throw in a scene of a T-Rex running through a city oh, it, and also a boat crash. Was, oh, Speed 2, I think was Speed it. 2, yep. that's it. Yeah, Godzilla and Speed 2. So on a boat that ran into a dock, uh, a Godzilla popped out and ran through San Diego. And that that came from Sp I mean, it was Spielberg who was like, if they're going to do this, I'm going to if they're going to put a movie out against my movie this summer, then I'm going to have, you know, if they're going to have Godzilla, I'm going to have. Yeah, yeah I mean, it was just Spielberg. That was Spielberg being his most Spielbergian and be like, well, I'm going to outdo them with all of this stuff. And so you get this boat crash. <laughs> in That's the amazing. Jurassic Park. Like, oh, oh, OK, cool. 
Uh, gentlemen, it's been weird. They cut you from the gymnastics team? There we go. All right. Hey, that's weird things. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes here, get ready for after things. If anybody needs to take a break, they should okay. go do it now. Yeah, and I'll charge my AirPods up. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Hills, yeah. Um, man. Life. What do you What do you guys think? What's gonna uh, happen? It comes at you pretty quick. Every you don't day. stop and look around. You might miss it. Every day. Yeah, I'm gonna figure with that. That's my favorite passage of Leviticus. <laughs> Uh, are you guys still playing Hearthstone? I haven't heard you talk about Hearthstone much in a while. Uh, yeah. I caught, yeah. I caught Justin this morning. You caught him? Yeah, I'm playing this deck that I'm losing with, but I'm having fun losing um, because it's a bunch of random mage spells, and so I just don't know what the deck's going to be, but at some point I just hope it overpowers the enemy, uh, and so far that has not been the case, so I assume I'm playing it wrong. Uh, but I'll have to go look up the strategy guide on it. But other than that, uh, I don't know. Eh, it's pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. Uh, Brian? I mean, the problem is that really all the really good decks are, are control decks, and I just I don't want to play a control deck when I'm on mobile because they tend to take, take forever. forever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I'm putting my money where my mouth was, and uh, I'm actually trying to make a run with the Mech Hunter, and uh, I made it to Dad Legend today. Uh, Which I think one is Dad Legend? Uh, five. five. Um, it uh, it's pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. Cool. Is this a new version or is it the old? No. Version? As a matter of fact, I was looking at uh, I was looking at the current meta, and the exact same version that took me to legend back in june is is still rocking 59 percent. so i was like well let's give it a go nice well maybe i'll switch to that i was making i was making i was mimicking andrew's airpods thing and then i actually accidentally oh. turned mine on and stopped the music oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh side note i finished uh the witcher by the way oh did uh, you like it uh, i mean you finished uh, it. That was great yeah. i really liked it i it was I really, it was just for what it was, the scale it was going to do. It never got, it's fantasy magic, fine. It never got okay. stupid. Um, I got to the end of it. I'm like, I enjoyed watching the journey where it went. And I, it's, it's not by no means, oh, it's perfect, but it's so much better than a lot of crap that I've heard. Like, I read like TV critics and stuff recommending. And that was the thing that yeah. sort of got, because I looked the reviews for it and they're kind of middling. I'm like, eh. Maybe, and then like it's a sixty-six percent of Rotten Tomatoes, but I'm like, I look at some of the other crap those people recommend, and I'm like, uh, what? There were little things that I really liked. Like I really liked that all the mages were kind of shitheads. Like yeah. it's kind of a gathering of shitheads. <laughs> like uh, I, I just, I really, I love that because it's like that's how I am. Like if you can just go like doodly doodly do, and and all of a sudden a magic thing happens, like you're gonna be kind of a shithead. Like uh, it just, it's gonna affect the way that you deal with 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 people. Um, uh, I, I don't know. It just, it always the 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 humanity of it was never sacrificed and and uh it that was i think what held it together for me in a story that constantly threw like one fantasy trope after another you're like oh well like, like what what binds this world together and it's like all of it any fantasy thing you can think of we have it here it, it's all here just just it, it, it yeah the, uh, that too we can also do that there's don't worry, there, there's an app for that in, in this universe. But the people made sense. I, I, mm -hmm. I got the people's motivations, and they were a lot more complicated. That's that's another thing, that it's, it wasn't just a straight-out morality play. Like, it, the, the, the characters kind of grew and had different facets, and time moves at, at a very specific pace in, in the show, and you kind of see how it affects people. You know, they're, they're, it, the issues with, you know, being told out of sequence, I get that the criticism of making it harder to follow, but it didn't matter that much. Um, I enjoyed a bit of the kind of the monster of the week while the bigger story built. 
Uh, I, you know, I thought that I, I think that some of the criticism might have been critics. Sometimes they tend to watch like the first three or four episodes of something and then maybe go to the jump and write the review because they don't, yeah. you know. Um, but, you know, the audience score is 93 percent and it's like an 18,000. I like I felt like, yeah, like this is just given the other crap that sometimes gets come out on some of the stuff that you just you just like I was just very uh, it was it was like you know like one of my my favorite surprise was like the boys the boys just just yeah. so was so much fun and you know I, but I like I'd say like this year the boys the terror season one again guys the terror season one yeah um, if you want master and commander with supernatural elements there we go that's the thing. yeah you know um the, I was definitely just baffled uh, 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 of three episodes into Witcher. Like, I, I I didn't fully understand what the hell was happening. I didn't follow, like, all the different places they were going or, or all, you know, how everybody connected. And then the banquet episode happens, and I literally just had that moment where I was like, oh, was that, is that the place from the earlier thing? Like, uh, uh, and, and then it is, and you're like, oh, and then you realize how that story unfolds. Uh, and by the end of it, you're like, oh, wait, we certainly took this very weird route around, but I know a lot about this world now. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like by, by the end of it, I was like, damn, I know who these people are. I know the, the bad people. I know how the bad people have become the bad people. I know what 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 the hopes for the future are i know who our allies are i know who our our enemies are like that i hats off cuz uh, three episodes in i was like oh what what what's going to happen now now the, the next episode we're going to visit the crab people and then then and they are going to have a majestic dance you're just inventing stuff and by the end of it i knew everything so so big uh, big big shout out to witcher yeah and, and they're I don't know a lot about how that world works, and there are a lot of things they just sort of brushed by, either from intent or editing or whatever. But I liked that more than, you know, two or three filler episodes and taking too long. I I, I preferred this of being a little bit. It was like the first time you watched Star Wars as a kid. You're like, yeah. I don't know everything here, but everything looks cool, and I think there's a reason behind it. So, um, yeah. All right. We ready? <laughs> now that we've done our mid, our, our between show. <laughs> yeah. Well, normally it's just me and Bryce talking about anime. Yeah, that's right. Uh, thank you guys. So I got to take a break also. Uh, all right, you guys want to do a quick after, a little after things? Yeah. Let's yep. Do, that's a dope yep. way. Yeah. All right, take dope. it away uh, in three, two. Hello, and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Justin Robert Young. What's up? Mr. Bryce Castillo. Yo. Hi. I got a question for you all. How do you Yo. know when you're half-assing it or you're working hard enough? No. Oh. oh, man. Ah, you put that one on my... Uh, I mean... Put that one on my gravestone. I, <laughs> I don't know. All right. That's it for after things, guys, because I don't <laughs> have an answer for that one. Like, that one... <laughs> oh. Woo! I don't know. Now I'm thinking about it now. I have no idea. I mean, I, I would imagine it's all about flow state. It's when, you, when you're when you lost in doing the thing, you're probably doing it as fast as you're able in that moment. If you're even able to ask the question, am I working hard enough, then you probably haven't achieved that flow state, right? But there's also pacing, right? You can't be in flow state 100% of the time. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I assume, yeah. uh, but, but yeah, but I mean, well, uh, so like, all right, uh, uh, for example, season two of Raise the Dead, want to do it, I've, I've charted out what I'm reading, so now the question is, now that I know a little bit more about the process, what should I be doing, and what is the pace I should be doing it at, because part of it is that I have now is like, all right, I'll read until I kind of get bored of reading, and then if I'm listening to something, I want to be listening to other podcasts in that genre so I can just know, have a better sense of where uh, uh, the audience's expectation of quality is, right? So I'm, 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 I'm not going in as blind as I was last time where I only listened to things that I liked and then I made a product that I liked. 
now that I feel more confident in my brand of the show, I want to listen to other things so I can I can just understand where I don't want to stop quality wise. Uh, but even then, at what pace? How fast should I be going? When is when am I listening to too many things that I'm enjoying? You know, uh, versus reading. How how far is that being pushed back? Like that that the uh, the, the the alchemy of it is is still foreign to me. I. I'll give you an example. Nick, part of the reason I brought this up was I had somebody who would uh, contact me. They'd been working on a book and they said, Hey, my book's been out. My book hasn't been doing as well as I would like though. And they spent a lot of time on the book books, you know, like a full size, full length novel. And I, cause my advice was like, yeah, start by launching on Amazon, you know, see things there, see your audience. And then they're like, yeah, that didn't work. I'm, I'm thinking about like maybe hiring some people to help do a new version or whatever. And I went to go look at the Amazon page for the thing and the cover art for it. And if this person's listening, I'm apologizing. I'm not going to use names. The cover art for it was horrific. It was literally like they took an image and then they dropped two other images on of them. One of them, they didn't even bother to like, like lasso cut. Right. Yeah. It was, it was horrific. And I'm like, nobody's going to buy this from the look alone. Like we can't even, we can't even speak to the quality of what you did, but it was like, and I was thinking about this, and I know in this person's situation, like, because I, I, I'm sympathetic, because like, they spent all this time writing the book, probably a year, two years, whatever, writing the book, and they finished it, and then the first reaction they want to do is they just want to get it out there, and I'm like, for the love of God, go to 99 Designs, go to somewhere, pay a hundred bucks, you know, buy a generic cover that you have the rights to, anything to be better. But in their mind, you know, the experiment failed, but they don't know why. And it, and it may be because they're not a good writer. I don't know. But I've seen this repeatedly. I have friends in the publishing industry who go off and self-published, and then I see their final products, and I'm like, this looks horrible. Like, you you, you got to the – you got, you know, you know, you got almost to the end, to the goal line, and then you just threw up on yourself. <laughs> I guess none of us have anything for that. <laughs> Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, I will. I will say this: that there is a bare minimum of aesthetics that needs to be met, and that is a lesson that I think uh, is hard to learn, and is uh, you know, uh, 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 it, it is it, it is a difficult lesson. What I and I guess it's not just the aesthetics part. Is I know I'm making that mistake in parts of my life. I know there are things that I am doing, and I'm not doing that other thing because I'm not aware of it. I don't know what that is. And I've, yeah. like I said, I've seen books from people who should know better, and I pick up the book and like it's formatted wrong. And I'm like, you and and I think in some cases I know some of those people. They are just you can't tell them they're immune to it. They don't want they're. To, I guess maybe the part of the problem is you don't want to reach a point where you then shut off all criticism. I think that's maybe a danger as maybe there's a point where we're the most vulnerable is when we need to hear it the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but um, I mean, back to the, uh, to the original question, how do you know when you're working? Um, I don't know. It sounds like we're talking about kind of two different issues here. Uh, what was half-assing it? I said, "How do you know when you're half-assing it, or whatever?" And that's kind of the point. Was like, uh, it's it's it's, it's okay. tough because because I'm actually a fan of half-assing things. Uh, insofar as half-assed things tend to get done, whereas perfect things very rarely get done. So it's like I don't I don't want I don't want to bag on half-assing it because in general, if you're half-assing it, you're at least doing it. Well, let's qualify so, that though, because because like person writes a book which is great and that book probably could use editing a lot of things but the problem is is that like there is there's a point where you half ass it too much like ah, i recorded a podcast on a freeway you know with a bunch of cars driving by and i put it out there hey i'm doing things it's like maybe that's a little too much half-assed yeah i guess there, there's got to be somewhere between perfect is the enemy of good which is i think what, what brian's point is and that is well made and like all right but you you got to show up like you, you have to show up to work with pants on, right? Like, like there, there, there is some lesson where it's like, okay, minimum requirements do exist in some of these fields. But you know, oddly and, enough, for the three of us, none of us have to show up with pants on. <laughs> That's that is a good point. Yeah, that is a good check. point. Well, and also, you know, um, 
I think there's a difference between like effort and amount of time spent because it did originally sound like we were kind of talking about pacing in terms of if you're half fast or working hard enough. Yeah. Um, but you could spend a hundred hours on whatever that book cover you, you were the book cover you were describing, Andrew. And whether it's a technical thing that they just don't have the skills and that's the best thing that they can put together, you know, it's 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 also not just, you know, working harder, but also working smarter and, and trying to, I guess, keeping an eye out for things that uh, the others maybe aren't responding as well to and seeing like in that case where you could uh, outsource or, or, you know, reach out, consult with someone else about a design or an element of your process. Okay. So you used a very good phrase there, which is working smarter. And I think that's one of the things that like, like, like uh, Brian, like, cause I completely agree with you. Like you, if you try to make perfect, you'll never get anything done. And I had, once I said, I just want to write good books that made my life easy. If I said I was going to write great books, I'd never release anything. And I do, I hundred percent believe in what you said there that you, you can't say, ah, I got to wait till it's perfect. But there, you, you are very open to feedback loops. You're very, you put stuff out there. You're like, tell me what you think. Tell me what you think. Tell me what you think. And I think that's one of the things that's missing sometimes in processes. I think in some of mine is I don't want people to tell me what they think because I'm afraid. And then I end up not making something as well as it could be. And I would say that might be kind of the, you find a half ass, but also have a space to find out what you need to do to make it better. Or that's the, how to work smarter. It's like, I made a thing. Now, how do I make the thing better? And how do I, how do I get that feedback? How do I get that information? Yeah, I wish I, I wish I had any idea as to what that dividing line is. Uh, I, I really don't, though, because uh, I, I, I agree. It's something that only you can know for yourself. But and there definitely is a, a two sides of the line. Uh, but for the life of me, I wouldn't be able to tell anybody. Well, yeah, but, wait, but I think the, but you definitely told me on Raise the Dead. Yes, uh, but that was. Um, uh, I, I, even even that 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 was just a gut reaction. It, I I don't have any sense of a hard and fast rule, right? Like, well, what I, I'm saying, I think we just were. It's the forest for the trees. Both of you, I think, have very good processes, and it's so inborn to you. You don't even think about it. Like like I said, Brian, like you ask for input. You go, what do I need to do next on this? You look at YouTube comments and stuff, and you say, okay, how do I use this to improve? You read emails. That's your process. And that's so natural to you. The thing is, a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people, they make a thing and they want to push it out into the world at the point that all they want from the world now is just the praise, not the how do I make it better? And I would say that's the missing link there is the idea of here's the thing. It's here. I, I, I've done what I know. Though I know what my knowledge stops here. Now I need the knowledge from other people to make it better. Yeah, I, and, I, and I would say that's a fair analysis in that I don't perceive that anything is ever done. Everything is just whatever the latest iteration is. You know, if, if we don't get it right this particular episode of Scam Nation or Monorug or whatever, then we'll try to get closer to getting it right next time. So I would say then I guess that's – I mean that does help clarify for me because I think that's like the big dividing line is that there are – the people who go like, okay, now tell me how to make it better. Those are the ones that succeed and do tremendously. The ones that say, hey, I've made the thing. Now tell me how great I am. Those are the ones that suffer because they miss out on the most important process, which is the feedback cycle. Sure. Um, so that's helpful. So let's go to the other issue, which was the pace. Like, yeah, how hard should we be working? Man, that's tough. That's tough because I, I am a burster by nature. And I think that it ate away at me for a very long time. And in fact, uh, I'm trying to be better at being a plotter over, over a burster. And, uh, um, uh, I, 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 I don't feel qualified to really chime in on this because all I've done is burst and I've seen it well, let hollow me, me out from the inside. Let me ask you this also, Brian, because I think your fundamental uh, change now is that you are now the leader of an organization and like a, a group, you can be a group of bursters, right? But if you're doing an organization which will only get further and further away from you, uh, uh, you need to set an example of plotting, right? Like you right. need to say, hey, look, it'd be great if everybody could burst all the time and, and we could all blast through these goals faster. But at minimum, you, you need to plod. And that means that because all organizations eventually take the the personality of their leader 
that's something that you need to find in yourself if you want to impart onto other people. Yeah, and especially because bursting almost almost as a certainty, you as a individual will not happen to be bursting when everybody else wants to be bursting. So yeah. it's not helpful for you to kick in the door and be like, I'm ready to burst. And nobody else is, is, is there, uh, on there. And, and by nature, plotting means that you have to show up when you don't feel like showing up and, and yep. so on. Uh, so how, how has that process gone? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm still learning. I'm working on it. Well, what are you a cop? You know, you have to say if you're a cop. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to read from that, uh, 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 work in progress. <laughs> uh, yeah, very much so. Very much so. I'd say the Brian Brushwood on this show now is very different from four or five years ago when I first started here um, in terms of the of of taking that bursting energy and directing it in various places. Um, yeah, and, and I, I guess I, I, if there's any achievement that's happened over the last four or five years, it's been figuring out how to how to bottle bottle up that energy and I don't know pickle it for lack of a better word, so, so that some amount of it will be there when when we need it and using it, uh, using it productively. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. Which is funny though because I think Brian, so much of your life was lived on someone else's schedule. And and really, the the existence the, the existence that you have now is an extrapolation of the free time that you had while you weren't being told where to go. And granted, it wasn't the the show up every day nine to five of Dell, but now all of a sudden that you had the touring magic show, it was just like dates fall out of the sky, right? And you hustle for those, and then you work your life around. And now, the the life you have is a professionalization of what used to be the time in between. Would that be a, a fair oh, uh, description? A hundred percent. Now we've reached the bizarre level where um, uh, there was a, there was a, a gig proposal that came up and I had to say, no, I, uh, uh, at, at that amount of money, I'm not allowed to go do this because it's an earthquake to the whole organization. It, it, it takes me out of the loop for two days. Uh, uh, I would love to emotionally, I would love to for my sense of self-esteem, but, but I can't in good conscience do the gig. And so, sorry. Uh, what's that? Oh, no, yeah. Sorry, Johnny. Ryan's not going to do your birthday party. That's I mean, kind <laughs> yes. of like, like at some point yes. you're just like, no, I'm not in the business of saying yes to that anymore. Uh, but, but also it's like you created a personal life and a structure of hobbies, uh, that were there to benefit yourself professionally, but we're also there because you enjoyed them. Right. And now you are in the very weird transition of, professionalizing that like that like what, what used to be the professional part now is no longer uh uh and now everything that you have was built from hey i want to have a studio in my house and i want to have virtual friends or i want to be able to capture the the, the scam school stuff or i want to make scam school more my own right uh and i want to do it on my schedule and not and not be flown out yeah, it's, uh, and, and, and it's, it's, it's doubly difficult because now I have to do the really hard work of internalizing the reality of what we're up to now. Like uh, for, for, for the first five years that you and I would hop on a webcam and try to make the comedy show, uh, it felt to some degree like we were play pretending at being comedians. And then now we're doing the hard work of internalizing. No, wait, we're actual award winning money-making comedians and 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 you 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 have to have um uh, i don't know uh, balance the internal world has to match the outward reality and 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 that's that's uh more work than i would have expected it to take i i still haven't internalized the idea that i'm a writer right that's crazy that yeah. that is i mean crazy i like to write and I do what my publisher says, do some edits, do this thing like this, but I still don't like, like still have imposter syndrome. I still go through all of that. And, you know, yeah. Weird. Um, imposter syndrome, is something that has been very weird for me because on some level I am terrified to speak to other people that are theoretically my peers 
but on the other hand, I don't feel that I'm not one of them. <laughs> and, and, and if anything, I very much feel that like that fraudulence reigns. And even if I am a fraud, I am only one of many that creates the entire whole. Yeah. Yeah, I went to. I was at a a, a conference or a, a one of the one of these writing conferences there, and I uh, my publisher put together a little cocktail to meet some of the other writers there. And I'm talking to these other people, and I'm like, wow, like these are real writers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, and like I go into the, you know the banquet, and my book is on every table because it was one of these awards things like this. And I'm like, but I still in my head, I'm like, uh, what? I'm a pretender, you know. So, and, uh, honestly, this is the thing that I thought about all weekend because I'm going to Iowa in two weeks, uh, and then uh, New Hampshire, and then Nevada, and and then based on the projection of the Patreon, I'll probably wind up going to South Carolina, but. I found myself like, I just want to, <laughs> I was talking to Andrew Heaton and I'm like, dude, you got to come to one of these things. I just need friends. Like I, I, I feel like I'm like the new kid in school. Like I'm like, I'm going to go and I'm, I'm not going to know anybody and all these clicks are going to be there. So I'm just like calling, I'm like emailing everyone that I know. And I'm like, Hey, will you hang out with me? Like, I just want to have somebody that like just shows me the ropes. I'm going to this like reporter high school thing that, that I, I am, I'm terrified of. Now I very much think I should be there. I very much am looking forward to creating the content there, but I also know that part of this is a networking thing for which I am totally unprepared and terrified of. Yeah. That's a good question. Like, how do you begin? How do you break into, to, to that crowd? Um, I mean, uh, I guess, the closest thing I could think of is when I started going to the college booking conferences and, uh, you know, I had no right to be there. I didn't know anybody. I wasn't established. Um, but I guess, I guess at the end of the day, you can always be the friendliest guy there. You can always be the one who's most interested in what other people have to say, the best listener and so on. We're going to well, see, we're going to find out, man, because I'm definitely going to, I'm definitely going to hang. I mean, it's not like I don't know some people I'll know. I don't know, guys. I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> here's here's So I've done I've done a couple of these meetups, like the NASA social events where you go to, you know, do be part of a social media thing, go there. And the thing that I'd realized a couple of years ago is like, I, you know, my nature is I can be extremely extroverted or extremely introvert. I think we're all like that. It's just flip yeah. the switch. One, you know, the switch is on. Hey, everybody, flip the switch. All right. Now I'm in my own world. And I, and I went the first time I went to one, I'm like, you know what? Um, I bet everybody feels like I do most. And like, you might see some people know each other, whatever, but there are far more people feeling like outsiders than insiders. Yeah. So the first thing I would do is I just look for a couple of interesting people. Hey, I'm doing, I'm Andrew. How are you doing? Like, Oh, who are you? Whatever. Do you know to be here? Like, no, well, hey guys. And I'd form a little cluster. And I did that yeah. the first time I did that, that uh, the group of us, you know, we, we did watched a lot. We went to Disneyland. We've stayed in touch forever. I went and did another one of those earlier this year, and the same. I did the same thing. Found a group of people. We all talked, whatever, and we just formed a cluster, and then we became the fun group, you know. And that's the thing that happens. Is it? And it was. And it was not. Wasn't one of these fake like, hey everybody, let's be. It's like, hey, how are you do? I don't know anybody. Oh, you're cool. Let's hang out. I'm like, hey, let's go grab dinner together. Let's go meet here. And that was sort of my way. Was like in a very sincere like, hey, I don't know anybody. You guys seem interesting or whatever. Let's just hang out. So, but but I, it, I it, agree. But, I agree. No, there's nothing that you've said that is incorrect. Everything you said is totally a hundred percent true. Uh, uh, and the the big key here, uh, to be totally honest, the big thing that that does warm me is focusing on the work. Is just like thinking about like, all right, you want to know what? At the end of the day, the one thing that I know will make me so much more in my own in my own world and, and, and comfortable enough to think about those social dynamics is focusing on the work, knowing that like I got something good at good out. I'm serving the audience. They are going to enjoy it. Uh, uh, and I feel happy about that. And if I can do that, then I will be much better at making friends. You know, for many of us hearing Justin Robert Young talk about kind of social anxiety or issues about making friends is like hearing 
Donald Trump has uh, insecurities about or doesn't feel confident. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, uh, well, yeah, I'd have, I mean, it, uh, I mean, Andrew, Andrew knows, I mean, Andrew's known me since I was in high school. I've, I've no, always, but... always been an insecure, an insecure person on some level, but also it's like, there are, there are elements where it's like, oh, okay, well, if you create your own little world or, and, and you're inviting to people, uh, of, to be a part of it, then that does aid in, in, in a lot of stuff. Yeah. And I, I think that, that you some groups are defined by what they're not or by being judgmental. But if you, you know, we, we created a really neat community and we started iTricks, yep. you know, because we're like, we said, you know, there's so much of this clickishness and this bitchiness in magic. And we don't want that. We don't want that. We want to be a positive, Hey, we love this. Let's talk about what we love. Let's as the, the kind of leaders of the community, let's downplay any people going negative and stuff. And sometimes emailing people like, Hey, I know you're a good guy, but you said this thing. And people won't perceive it this way, whatever. We've we've had those conversations with people like, hey, like, here's how to get along with everybody, not let's you're an enemy kind of thing. And it worked out pretty well. And I think what you guys have done with, you know, uh, you know, Diamond Club, NSFW show and all that and Night Attack, you know, through the ages, what you guys have done, if you created this community of people and say, like, we're all a bunch of weirdos. We're all outsiders sitting at home, staring at our internet, you know, looking for something to do. We acknowledge that, accept that, and we accept you. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's I, I, it's so funny because like I'm hearing uh, Andrew's words, and I'm like, yes, they're 100 percent true. And then I see Justin's face, and I'm like, yeah, that doesn't make it any easier to go out and make new well, friends. Said, look, <laughs> I mean, this is all good. This is all fun and games, and everybody's gonna be doing good. And 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 then I'm gonna be at that Marriott bar. Yep. In Des no, I, I understand that there, there's a difference between the thousand foot view, the real time strategy game, and the first person shooter. Like like you know that you're gonna be in that first person shooter experience and it's gonna I'm suck get, i'm gonna get i'm gonna get that show done and it's gonna be great i'm gonna feel good about myself and then i'm gonna be like all right i gotta go network i definitely shouldn't just sit here in this hotel room and go to sleep i should definitely go and network that's why i'm here if i want to continue to to make myself somebody in politics then i gotta go i gotta go to where i know people are there and then i'm gonna go there and either gonna i'm gonna have friends that we can either matriculate and they're going to know, or I'm, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to get that bottle of Bud Light, but I'm just going <laughs> to be like, ah, ah, ah. so uh, I, I, the term networking, uh, I, it has always frustrated me because, you know, I've experienced the worst side of it and that pressure of like, ah, you got to go here and network. And it's like, so I go around and introduce myself to 20 people and hope something happens. Like that's, that's like as demoralizing as doing close up magic for people who don't want to see it. And, my approach is like, I don't network. I'll go to a party and I'll talk to the nearest person to me and talk to them and talk to a couple other people and have nice conversations. If there's somebody super interesting there or whatever, if I happen to talk to them, fine, but I'm not going to go try to go do that because whenever I do, I always walk home feeling, well, Uber home feeling empty and shallow. But if <laughs> I just go like, hey, let me just talk, meet a couple interesting people, talk to the person who's Maybe, and I found that sometimes, like, I've gone to some, because I get invited to some cool parties in LA, and sometimes the least interesting person I'll just talk to, I find out is the most interesting person in the room, you know, because, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't, I say, like, forget now, we're like, hey, there are a couple of people like, yeah, just go hang out with them and not I, put I, the pressure I on. I, I'm not thinking about, like, oh, well, I mean, who am I going to talk to that takes my career to the next level? Yeah. Like, uh, it, it is more just talking to those other people and, yeah. Yeah, I mean, take, don't network, don't network, but do go to the bar and hang out. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, to some degree, and keep in mind, I'm the least qualified person to speak to this because I've spent the least amount of time single of anyone on the panel. But uh, it feels like dating. Like you don't go out and intend to meet the one. Just go out and meet a one because uh, don't, don't try to meet the person that is the right one. Meet the person who down the road will introduce you to the person. That's the right one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, uh, it's one of those things where I'm like 50%. Well, now I'm fit. Cause we've been talking about it. It's growing, but it's like 50% now in general. I'm not, too worried about it because I do know a few people. Like yeah. I do, I've and I'm DMing 
I'm gonna make sure. Like when I went to Politicon, I was very happy because I knew a few people that were there and I had Heaton and uh, uh, then I wound up meeting other people that I had met through BitTorrent. So like I I had a little like I could I could do the the anybody who's been to convention knows that you have that that text rundown, right? You have like the one person and then you see what they're up to and then you text a few other people. I got like two or three people I can text and that I'm happy about. I'm I'm uh, that that makes yeah. me a lot happier. Now if they stop responding to me, I will immediately panic and probably fly home crying. Yeah. Well, we're used to that. <laughs> the reason, you know, the reason we're here is because at a conference, Brian struck up a conversation with me. Yep. You know, and and it was, and I don't think Brian, you were trying to meet everybody or network at there. It was like, you know, we were both young guys doing what? How long ago it was? Doing similar stuff in the same sort of area, and and Brian's like, ah, oh, we'll talk. We started talking about that and stayed in touch, and then, you know. Next thing you know, yeah, here we are. Th there's um, uh, this is something that is talked about in the book, The Formula. He talks about uh, uh, when performance can't be measured, network effects determine success or whatever. Those those mm -hmm. loose, uh, weak connections really, really matter. So, like, that's one of the nice things is it reduces the stakes. It's not like uh, you have to find your next collaborator for, you know, uh, for a time life set of 13 books. You just have to find somebody that you kind of know so that when you have a question, oh, wait, who do I know that knows that person mm -hmm. comes to mind? Yep. That's a great point. All right. Any picks? Uh, I finally got my kid to watch Firefly. So I just uh, this morning Ooh. watched the uh, the first episode of Firefly, 90 minutes long. Um Still holds up. So it's, it's a little bit. Um, uh, I think we rewatched it for Cord Killers a little while ago, and uh, it, it its low budgetness shows a bit more after uh, nearly twenty years. But um, but the storytelling and the characters uh, very worthy. Um, hey, uh, Bryce, how would you describe the cast? I I think that they've all aged at one year per year since the show came out almost twenty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is. <laughs> I went and read that email, by the way. I, I feels I, like a a, a, a disproportionate. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you, uh, you got to tell everyone the story. Uh, yeah. Bryce, I don't even Bryce remember called, it. That's the funny thing. Bryce I don't... called. Bryce levied a fiery critique <laughs> uh, uh, to uh, to the most adorable cast member, calling her a bitter old hag. <laughs> Tom Merritt said the entire cast is too old to come back for a revival. I, I think maybe that's what reports tell me. And you said specifically <laughs> that Jewel State character. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think I think pouring gasoline on the fire was the metaphor that was used. Um, but so uh, uh, Firefly, uh, the visual effects maybe not holding up so much. Uh, well, not so much the visual effects, uh, but the practical effects. Like, um, mm. there's a lot of times that with fresh eyes, you're able to say, that's a golf cart <laughs> with a bunch of, like, plastic <laughs> things taped to it. <laughs> well, it is a secondhand sort of, you know, uh, space civilization, you know, Brian? And maybe it is supposed to be a golf cart. With a bunch of <laughs> maybe. Uh, I, you know what, I have to go back and watch it, rewatch it, but, like, it was one of the shows people talked about at the time, and I'm like, eh, I'm not going to end that into this thing. And then, you know, when I sat down to watch it, I really, really liked the way that world it built. I loved that universe. I liked the characters. And I thought, I thought, you know, it, to me, it was like Joss Whedon doing, you know, some of it. Joss Whedon taking a medium that's been overdone and tropish and going in there and doing something really fun and fresh with the characters and what goes on there. And uh, I enjoyed it. Like, I really like, you know, uh, uh, between, you know, the Mal character, Adam Baldwin's character, whatnot, like they were just the, the funny twists that they would go into were just great. So, you know, there's every now and then there's talk of a revival. And unlike some people, like, you know, I don't know the full availability of everybody there, but I, I would I would love that universe to be brought back. Well, and, and yeah. we, we talked about it because there were there were mysterious tweets as uh, Fox programming people were giving keynotes. And so. 
Um, they said yep. the thing that they always say, which is, yes, we do own Firefly. And wouldn't it be great if that made some money again? Which, wouldn't it be great? Yeah, and I guess Tim Minear is the, the producer on that, which, you know, we can see. Yeah. You and Whedon come together. We would go. So you know, that, that franchise keeps going. There's like, there's a, I'm sorry, there's like an audio, there's a couple books out now too that take place in that world. Mm. Cool. Uh, one of the things that I've been trying to do for Raise the Dead is listen to other uh, uh, audio history series or popular podcast series. Uh, in general, one of the things that I'm not a massive fan of, I know is a very popular trope, uh, uh, largely because of the influence of, of This American Life, is the idea that your narrator is the real star of the story and that you are brought in through the narrator's motivations. Uh, uh, and I think that there's a certain element that is expected of that, and I certainly used a little bit of that at the beginning of Raise the Dead just to explain why the listener should care about it. Uh, but sometimes I think it can get a little overindulgent. End sentence, end paragraph, save document, close uh, program, shut down computer, reboot computer, open new document. I've been listening to Dolly Parton's America. <laughs> <laughs> and let me just say this. you, I, I think that there is very much a justification for doing, I think it's like a nine-part series on Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton is a fascinating figure, a trailblazer. Uh, uh, she is every facet that they are describing. And that's my review. <laughs> I like all those elements. <laughs> uh, it's, as I say, it sounds like a documentary now. Uh, you know, I, uh, I started a, a channel on my Discord because uh, I realized that if I start putting my opinions on Twitter, I'm going to start burning bridges in a field I have literally just entered before I have a chance to to even uh, uh, talk to anybody and 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 go forward. So, uh, boy, Dolly Parton, they do a lot of interviews with Dolly. She is amazing, uh, uh, and and there are great, great, great parallels of why Dolly Parton and really country music. Uh, has transcended the world, how much of a common story country music tends to capture uh, of of uh, the immigrant story and uh, a poor uh, struggle and, and a struggle to be free but also understand your pain. And that is something that a lot of the world, there's a reason why country music is a global phenomenon because so much of the world understands that. Uh, you know, and that's great. These and also, are great things. Jad Abumrad. Yeah gonna 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 have a fight with Justin Robert Young at the Bayou just after nope. after school. No. Nope. Come on. No. Nope. I've do only it. said positive ch things. Ch ch I've ch only ch said positive things about mm. uh mm. about uh about Dolly Parton's America. That's all I've said. <laughs> yeah. I I I'm curious about that. I love Dolly Dolly Parton. I love her story, you know, and it just you know what she's been able to build, everything like that, how she started. You know, she was she was not beloved when she first started because she was like the the partner in a, a country music act where yep. she replaced like the favorite, and then she was the new one and wasn't well liked. And then when she went to do her solo career, people advised against it and stuff. And it's wow. just uh, yeah, there's know. there's 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 a great the, uh, the 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 series does seem to alternate between straight description of the very colorful, amazing life of Dolly Parton and then these larger kind of themes. Why does Dolly Parton, uh, you know, one of the things that the first episode gets to is the co-opting of Dolly Parton as a feminist icon and whether or not Dolly herself thinks of herself as a feminist icon. Uh, spoiler alert, she shoots it down immediately. And so they kind of uh, 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 sew together the gulf between uh, those ideas. And I think that those are great, that these are, these are great, great ideas. Yeah. <laughs> totally unrelated. Uh, Bryce? Uh, yeah, I gotta think. Did anybody here ever watch uh, a, uh, a, a live action show called Children's Hospital? No. On, uh, Adult Swim, the Adult Swim channel. Uh, -uh. uh maybe the the spin-off NTSF SD SUV the sort of CSI like parody 
<laughs> no, no. So uh, that entire crew just got uh, ju just put together a new uh, Netflix show called Medical Police. This is actually canonically a part of the Children's Hospital universe. It starts off even in the in Children's Hospital in <laughs> Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, and it it follows uh, two of, two of the doctors who um, are, are uh, on the staff of of the hospital there who get wrapped up into this whole um, viral outbreak and uh, uh, end up traveling, quote unquote, the world and visit international locales that are not just <laughs> Pasadena with color filters uh, <laughs> <laughs> to track down uh, uh, this virus and, and uh, s save the world. And it's, it's a, it's a lot of like very, um, uh, non sequitur sort of humor, very uh, a little random, kind of dumb in a lot of places. Um, but uh, I I think it's it's neat. You know, it's weird because it is kind of a semi serialized story. They're mostly trying to solve this one case uh, in in this series or in this I guess this season. Uh, but it's it's fun, and I think uh, if you had any, if you remember or uh, if if you like any of the the people, Rob Corddry was uh, is the creator on it. Uh, Aaron Hayes and Rob Hubel are the stars, and they are both fantastic uh, in this, uh, as I thought they were in Children's Hospital. Um, but, uh, and I think this is directed by David Wayne. Uh, he's from... a creator. I think there are different directors, if I'm not mistaken. From what I have not seen a lot of it, but from what I've heard it described, uh, uh, if you liked, like Wet Hot American Summer is another David Wayne. David Wayne was one of uh, the members of the state, so... Stella, uh, Wet Hot American Summer uh, are are examples of his work. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but but a lot of it is that same, you know, uh, uh, almost like slapsticky on on some level. A lot of like characters just being intentionally obtuse or the random like uh, a, a joke for the sake of pattern interruption. Uh, I, I can't wait to see it. Yeah, uh, it's on Netflix. I think it's 10 episodes. Yeah, 10 half-hour episodes uh, on Netflix. Nice. Andrew? My pick is a, uh, you know, I tend to, when I write code, I tend to like watch, you know, just YouTube videos, find a bunch of YouTube stuff to watch to play in the background. And I watched a series of, uh, by it, I think he calls, he calls the channel the company man and he does these kind of these sort of these kind of like 10 12 minute 15 minute deep dives into stories of different companies and how they got their origins um I'll ask you guys a question mm -hmm. uh what does Arby's stand for Arby's like 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 their their values the name where does the name come from oh I know this one I I, I did a big old hat Bryce thinks he knows it but Bryce doesn't know I it. do know it I think I do uh, Justin, right, Bryce, what do you think? Oh, I, I got no idea. See, a lot of people might think it stands for roast beef, but I think it's the name of the brothers, the Damn last it, name of the brothers it, who Bryce. founded it, right? Damn it, Bryce. You're right. You're, right. <laughs> 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 You're like, no, Bryce doesn't know it. Bryce did it. Uh, yeah, like the Raffle Brothers, the two brothers that started it. 100% Bryce. Again, you surprised me. Um. <laughs> uh, but yeah, because people hear RB, roast beef, and then like, like mm -hmm. no, nah, it's the Rabble Brothers, you know, RB. But yeah, um, so Company Man uh, uh, is neat. It goes into these dives and, you know, what happened to this company, the rise and fall of these companies. And so he does mm -hmm. these really neat kind of, you know, examinations and stuff. And it's kind of a neat way to kind of look into behind these brands and stuff. And, you know, he just, you know, a lot of, you know, kind of, you know, internet research goes through there and tries to find, you know, the different sorts of, you know, somebody said this, somebody said that. And that's what I liked is was a little bit deeper, like that, like, if you had asked me this question two days ago, I would have got it wrong, bro. I'd be like, it's our, it's roast beef, you know? Um, uh, and then I watched this and now you killed my chance at smugness. Thank you. Um, uh, and the, uh, like, you know, it goes like the eBay, like, Oh, how did eBay get its start? And a lot of the times it's a very good example of how, like, you'll hear the story like, Oh, eBay got its start because this guy wanted to help his wife sell her like Pez collector, his girlfriend sell her Pez yeah. collection and stuff. And, after you read enough biographies and stuff and you listen to ones where they, where they do original resource and you start to realize how much of what we know and they go, oh, everybody says this was 
Yeah, an article was written in 1995, and 10 other people quoted that article, mentioned that article, or mentioned it without quoting where it came from, and now it's become the truth, but it's not, you know, or it's one version of something. And anyhow, I like it because he does a little bit deep, digs a little bit deeper to get some of the more stuff in there. So Company Man is my pick on YouTube. Very cool. Nice. Nice. Uh, gentlemen, it's been after. Hey. Woo. Here we go, everybody. Alrighty, well, that's going to do it here for us. Uh, for Weird Things Today, Court Killers is off this week due to Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Yeah. Uh, depending on what the rest of my day looks like, we might have a surprise stream in the evening. So, <gasps> Ooh. I'm just going to say, get your marble thumbs right. Oh. That'd be fun. oh. I only have two regular thumbs. Uh, are they, they going to get a marble they, one? They, ah, they right. got it. Yeah. Oh, no, Andrew has no <laughs> thumbs now. <laughs> uh, thank you everybody for watching we will be back tomorrow with a new night attack yes we will do night attack tomorrow and then we'll do it the next day and then the next day and then the next day that's, that sounds right right yes, no, forever and ever calendar is not showing me. your body makes a promise <laughs> jeez <laughs> <laughs> alright everyone have a good rest of your Monday bye 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 bye